Okay, December 3rd, Board of Cosmetology meeting called to order. Uh, we'll have roll call starting with Ms. Huckabee. June Huckabee, present. Merle Smith, present. Nana Coppinger, present. Linda Colley, present. Janet Wormsley, present. Pearl Walker, present. Rufus Hereford, present. Okay, we have two sets of minutes that were sent to us, and we appreciate that, so we have time to look at them real carefully. Let's first uh, cover October the 1st meeting minutes. Is there any discussion on October the 1st minutes? If not, I have two. On page 8, I just cannot remember the circumstances. I noticed that up at the top where it says miscellaneous request, Miss Moss asked um, that she be wavered from retesting due to medical issues, and we issued her a waiver. Uh, wait a minute, make sure I got it up. That's not the one I was talking about, forgive me. Miss Hart retired her license in 2011, not knowing that if she wanted to reinstate it, she would have to be retested. And we wavered her being retested. Then the next one, Tricia Logan retired her license to move to Georgia, unaware that she'd have to be retested if she wanted it reinstated. And we denied her request. Do you remember why we denied one and not the other? Uh, Miss Hart was 2011, and Miss Logan was 2009. That's and that's why it was the distance of time. Okay. And then on page 10, miscellaneous forms at the very bottom. Motion made by Ms. Coppinger, second by June Huckabee, to approve of new shop inspection and notice of violation forms. That was the forms that they were going to change mm -hmm. uh, for the inspectors, and we wanted ours uh, to stay the same except the changing the degree. Okay. Right. I think that was what it, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the that's schools, it. The schools weren't included in that. Yeah. Alright, that's my only questions. Are there any other questions about the minutes? Yes, back at the, back at the top of page 10. Okay, uh, question. Is an infant technician allowed to use a pet to appeal with that? Pet. <coughs> Sorry. An institution services. And the board decision members requested additional information. We contacted the individual and she never got back in touch with us to provide additional information. As long as it's to do with the feet, it's uh, still in, in the nail, falls in the nail. It was some sort of chemical peel that she was okay. requesting and that's okay. why they... Is she the one doing it? The one yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. It was her salon at some sort of uh, Christmas... I looked that up on the internet. Yeah. And it's it's not like a real chemical peel by any means. Okay. Um, in fact, they have several different fragrances. Um, it can be raspberry, strawberry, um, different things. But it, after reading it, it not didn't a, sound very not, uh, pretty strong at all. Not an aesthetic thing. She must have changed her mind because I contacted her probably two times after the fact and left messages and never heard back. Okay, are there any other discussions on October the 1st minutes? If not, do I hear a motion to approve? I won't. I make a motion that we approve the October minutes. I second. Motion made by Ms. Carpenter, second by Ms. Walker, that we approve October the 1st minutes. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes carry. Now let's move to November the 5th minutes. Is there any discussion on the November the 5th minutes? If no discussion, no questions, do I hear a motion we accept? Now, Chairman, back then on page three, okay, um, instructor seminar extension request, okay, uh, from Miss Teresa Smith, due to health reasons, 
Uh, she provided the doctor's note, but the note did not provide the dates of her treatment. Have we, um, and the motion, I mean, the, yeah, the motion was uh, June and I, to request the date of Smith's treatments and to table this until December meeting. Number three, I mean, page three. I do not think that she's provided us any additional information on her treatment. She's not on our agenda today. Okay. So we cannot grant that extension until we're here. No. That's still okay. Then Madam Chairman, page six at the bottom. Have we heard anything from that? We do have that on the agenda okay. this Excuse this me. month to re review and they have sent substantial information. And also, we probably on the agenda, and I haven't looked at all of it, page 7, the bottom of it, about the uh, hours. We did not find that in the minutes, so yes, that question is being presented again to the board. Okay. And the top of page 8, about the transferring of hours. Uh, you all had removed the transfer of hours policy that it could only be transferred once and kept the remaining policy of how many hours for each curriculum could be transferred. So that decision was made last time. That's all my time. Okay. Is that all you have, Ms. That's all I have. Any other discussion? If not, do you already have a motion we accept? I so move. Motion made by Ms. Huckby that we accept November the 5th minutes. Do I hear a second? Seconded by Ms. Wormsley. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes carry. Okay. Assistant Commissioner. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. How are you all? Fine. We don't know if it's summertime or wintertime. I'm telling you, I'll take it whatever it is. Uh, 66 degrees in December is awesome. <laughs> Um, I don't really have anything. I wanted to come down and see if you guys had any questions um, about anything that we're doing. Uh, the search for your executive director is ongoing. I hope that uh, by the time that you meet next month that we do have a new executive director. Um, we've got, uh, we have received some resumes. We continue to receive some resumes. So uh, mainly I wanted to make myself available if you guys had any questions about anything. I know this is coming up on the agenda. In fact, I know it is. About the. Can we bring this up now? The eyebrow scanner? Sure. It's under staff attorney report. Well, can you go ahead and. Absolutely. In case sure. you have any comment. It's going to be at the very, very back if you all want to look at it, but I believe you all have it in front we do. of you. The beautiful eyebrows versus the Board of Cosmetology Chancery Court decision was entered in November, and all the board members were sent the order for approval. <clears throat> Excuse me. Basically, Chancellor Perkins made a decision that the Board of Cosmetology does not regulate eyebrow threading pursuant to the definitions and the statutes in the Cosmetology Act his decision by looking at the definitions of the rules was that it was the legislative uh, the legislature's intent at the time that this didn't exist in Tennessee and thus it couldn't be included and in order for the board to regulate it there would have to be legislative changes and um, so that's not something that we can make a rule change and we have gotten an opinion from the Attorney General's office, not a formal opinion, but we've spoken to the attorney who argued the case, and it is his opinion and their advice that we should not appeal this because the judge, part and partial, does mention that it needs to be a legislative change in order for us to be able to regulate the act of eyebrow threading. Um, in the day-to-day -day work, the inspectors have been notified that they can no longer write notice of violations for this. Any current cases that we have, we're going to recommend to close because we don't have the authority to regulate it. Um, 
and further, we have advised the inspectors if they go into a licensed aesthetic shop and there are violations of the act which don't include eyebrow threading, they need to still write notices for those and just be very aware of who is doing what in those shops if they are shops that are eyebrow threading and they are licensed and doing other skincare activities. Well, my question is for the health and safety of the public, who is overseeing their sanitation? The eyebrow threading act in particular? Yes. No the one is right now. Okay. So the little kioshes are not being inspected by anyone? I don't think that they, there are actually any kiosks because we had prevented them from opening kiosks in the past. We had written notice against those individuals and so they had gone to shops and applied for aesthetic shop licenses and we had opened them as skincare shops. And in those cases, some of those skincare shops did provide other services to be a skincare shop beyond eyebrow threading. Now, some of them only did perform eyebrow threading. So, you know, we do, uh, we are required to inspect skincare shops. So, even if they are simply eyebrow shops doing only eyebrow threading, unless they decide they don't want their license, then we still will inspect those shops. So. Okay, so but they're not they're technically not required to be licensed by us pursuant to this court order. I guess my question is if they made if they opened a kiosk, would anyone, the health department or anyone oversee them? No. According to my understanding of the judge's ruling, this is not a regulated process at this time. The judge has said that the statute does not grant the authority of the Board of Cosmetology to regulate this process. I think that um, and he also suggested that it should be a regulated process. In no way was he trying to say that, that we should not do that. I think the judge's ruling is correct. I thought it, was, it, was, it had been my position from day one about this. I think that we need to begin to work on uh, language to present to the legislature to allow for this. I think we also need to allow for a grandfather period for operators that are in business doing this. You know, the governor's, the administration's position, first of all, is always health, safety, and welfare. And a very close second is always um, the, the business aspect of it, the economic aspect of it. We have people out here who have operated in an, an emerging process, um, eyebrow threading, is a growing component or a piece of your business it's obviously more popular in certain cultures than others as it continues to grow prior to previously we you have not needed to regulate this process because it was not popular as it increases in popularity as it does many times with anything that the legislature decides to regulate they almost always unless there's imminent health safety or welfare issues to the public they almost always include a grandfather period to allow those operators who are, who are out there trying to conduct business properly um, to become compliant <coughs> with regulation to meet the criteria that the board sets or that the legislature sets and I think that's the proper way to do it I think that's the type of state government that the average Tennessean expects to have and I think we can do that in this case in no way did the judge say that this shouldn't be regulated. He just said that based on the language as it is today, it does not grant the authority of the board to regulate this process. We will have to have a legislative change. We will work with you to do that. Uh, we will, uh, as you know, the session starts in a couple of weeks, and we will begin to put together some language. As Councilor Power said, any disciplinary action that exists today regarding eyebrow threading will have to be absolutely dismissed. Um, and I think it it brings again to the surface for me the opportunity to talk to the board about, you know, we want to get people to work. That is what we, the, from the administration standpoint, only second to health, safety, and welfare is getting people to work. We want to do everything we can do to get people to work. 
that is always our second pro our second goal, only to health, safety, and welfare. This is a great example of how we can be a positive influence on the economy in the state of Tennessee, not by shutting people down. To my knowledge, we've not had a single complaint. I'm this. I may not be correct, but to my knowledge, we've not had a single complaint from a consumer regarding a poorly performed eyebrow threading operation. I don't. I, am I? Is anyone on the board aware of them? I haven't even seen it being performed in. I had to watch it on YouTube. <laughs> Could, I would like to add something. Sure. I had the opportunity, it's been several months back, to uh, be in a, a mall and watch that done. In, actually, it was on a Sunday afternoon. Yes, ma'am. And uh, they would do the threading, uh, the person that was doing the job, and uh, clean up with the tweezers. See, that's... You don't get that part of it, but but they did use the tweezers to clean up the what they didn't get with the thread. Well, and again, and, and it is it is certainly not the administration's uh, place to determine whether this should or should not be regulated. It's the administration's place, with the assistance of its council, to interpret the statute. It's the judge's place to decide that when the board's position and the statute meet head to head and don't agree it's then it, that's when the judge decides um, the final interpretation of the statute based on the advice of counsel they do not believe that we have a uh, a good enough case to proceed with an appeal i agree with that um, i felt like that that we were going to lose this case from day one and um i don't think i don't believe i thought that it was a probably a over interpretation of the statute to determine that we clearly rate that the board of cosmetology clearly unquestionably regulated the process of eyebrow threading again as miss huckabee states if someone's out there using tweezers that is not specifically spoken to in the complaint or the process of eyebrow threading it would be the same as uh, if you were a manicurist and also when you got done you gave somebody a little pill okay that's a different thing that is a violation of the statute but my, my reason for the comment I guess would be uh, we need to uh, change the air law and yes ma'am I think uh, I think we everyone agrees with that we would um, we will sit you know I would suggest that the board put together a ad hoc committee quickly to discuss this um, and with the particulars you know I think that the first thing that I would ask you to consider is if we are going to regulate it we need to be able to test for it uh, we need to be able to educate for it I think it's very difficult for us to say that we're going to regulate a process that we can't teach or test I have a question um, I understand like um, say for example uh, the threading business is set up in a kiosk in the mall and I understand that we, we don't have any purview to you know to regulate any of that but if a, a person is doing eyebrow threading it, an unlicensed you know person is doing eyebrow threading in a cosmetology shop then is there a disciplinary action we take that they're doing that in a licensed cosmetology shop or esthetician? Unfortunately, because it's not something we regulate or license, then no. But if the unlicensed person is doing tweezing while they're doing eyebrow threading, then they're doing an act without a license because that is part of the Cosmetology Act. So that is when I was saying when our inspectors going out, we want them to be very careful when they're looking for these things and be aware of what is licensed and what is unlicensed activity. And um, I had emailed them all this opinion and then I had also spoken with a few of them about it. And they all seemed fairly comfortable with, you know, looking closely because they all do, you know, take their shops under their arm and uh, have good relationships with most of them for that matter and they know which shops are doing eyebrow threading and which aren't so well I have a real concern about if 
uh, we make a decision, or if we get the legislat uh, legislature to change the law that we can regulate threading, there's, in my mind, there's an issue because the threading process that I saw, they hold the thread in their mouth, and I don't know that we would ever be able to accept that as, uh, you know, sanitary method of doing, you know, some kind of business. So I don't, it really concerns me that we, <clears throat> if, if we want to regulate it, we're going to want to change it. Right. Um, you know, again, those are, those are specific questions regarding um, the process that I'm certainly not qualified to to answer. I can tell you my personal opinion is if, if somebody wants to pay somebody to hold a thread in their mouth and rub across their face, I'll probably leave that up to them. But um, I don't know, I have no idea what the potential health hazards are of having somebody hold a string in their mouth and then rub it across your eye. I don't know. I'm sure there are some. But those are for the qualified uh, individuals to answer, and I'm certainly not that. Um, I think it's going to require some very intensive due diligence on the part of the board with some professional um, opinion, uh, opinions and analysis to look at what should we. What I would strongly encourage you to do is to not overcorrect whatever you do. If you start out with minimal regulation, just say, you know what, we're going to, uh, it, we're going to um, require that you are a cosmetologist or that you are uh, a certain level of licensee so that you've at least been through the basic health, safety, and sanitation uh, components of the education requirements and then move forward with expanding your the criteria for the, the specific process of eyebrow threading. It's going to take you months and months to really dive in, I think, to the specific uh, points regarding eyebrow threading. And I, I, the worst thing that we could do, though, would be to over-regulate right out of the gate by not doing proper, thorough due diligence on what we should really be doing. I would look at other states. I can tell you that my cursory um, analysis of it is that there are states that have regulated it and then stopped. There are states that currently do regulate it. There are other states that do not regulate it. So where does Tennessee want to be? I think that's up for you all, certainly, to decide along with the legislature. And um, I, what I would, I, my the priorities as I see them should, for the board should be based on the judge's ruling that we, yes, we should have some form of regulation of the process. Um, it, that does not mean that we should over-regulate it or under-regulate it. He just said that, yes, in his opinion, it definitely is a process. He was not saying it should not be regulated. That's not what he was saying. He was saying that the statute we have in place today does not allow for us to regulate it. The board will need to decide to what extent it's going to regulate it. From the administration standpoint, what we would ask you to do is to not over-regulate it initially, not ever over-regulate it, but be thorough in your analysis, um, have a, a process, lay out a timeline and a process, uh, put together an ad hoc committee, and um, anything that you do, we ask you to include some sort of grandfather period and then we will work with the legislature and the count our council here on language um, to try to help move that through but so I'll in that sense that we can prepare uh, a letter for you all to sign as a board in order to submit asking the action be taken in order for y'all to be able to regulate this. Now, if there's time enough to push that through into session this time, I'm not sure because we're so close, but that is something that... Well, my situation in my mind is I don't think we're anywhere close to this because, as you said, um, Commissioner, we'd have to have a form of education on this process, this technique. Well, that means the schools would have to have someone trained to teach it, then we'd have to have it put on the PSI test. Uh, it's very involved if we try to 
There right. is the, the, the order. court order mentions it from the Milady book, and it is in the book. Now, I don't know what the, the curriculum provides any education on the how to's of it, but I know that it is included in um, an explanation in the aesthetics book that I looked at the court order, looked back at the book, and I wanted to read all about it so I'd know more about it myself. So. Madam Chairman, Commissioner, I, still, I guess I still have a problem. Um, unlicensed people in a licensed shop and our inspectors. Well, if they're not performing cosmetology services, then they're just somebody in the shop. That's like doing a massage. You don't Right, we don't, right. We don't regulate that. Well, and I, I don't know. Is I mean, I, I'm just not uh, certain. Are shops allowed to perform services that are not regulated by the cosmetology board inside the shop? I don't know the answer to that question. You so you, you can do massages in a cosmetology shop? Then I think you would absolutely be allowed to perform eyebrow threading. Uh, probably much like maybe Botox, if somebody was performing Botox in their cosmetology shop. Would it not be uh, treated as, a, as you said, massage in the, the suntan booths and all that? It would need to be in a separate separate uh, area? I don't know. Uh, I'll, leave, well, I'll let no counsel. specifics in our statute regarding any regulation or exception, so we're kind of... There, there wouldn't be any way to follow through with a notice of violation against it because there's no regulation. Right. 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 Well, there is a, a unlicensed people working in the shop, though. We don't require you to have a license because it's not something we regulate. So if an, it's kind of a loophole. Yeah, that it does. Because, like, if it's an unlicensed person that's performing a manicure, then we do regulate right. that. But if unlicensed persons are performing threading. Right. Yeah. If an unlicensed person is working the cashier, right. working, yeah. that's right. no it, different. Exact, exactly. Um, one other question I had. Um, where is that question? <laughs> <laughs> one other question I had. Oh, would the health um, health and safety uh, board, would, would they want to regulate something like this as far as the health issues of it? Have they looked at it? I, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm not aware that they would, but it seems to me that there will be some overlapping because of the types of places that is performed, cosmetology, aesthetics, <clears throat> shops, and they'd be overlapping coming into the cosmetology field. Yeah, because like if they're set up in a kiosk, we don't regulate anything in, in that kind of uh, structure. I mean, because that's, we do have laws that say what kind of structure you have to have for uh, shops. And right. so um, then I just wondered if they were set up in a kiosk that maybe the health board would take care of the health issues of it. Yeah, I, I don't. I just don't know the answer to that question, and that would that would be for them to answer. I don't know. I mean, th that's why again I say this is there are so many unanswered questions about this regarding. I mean, they, that are going to have to be answered by the board in determining, you know, what the um, what level of harm to the is there to the public I don't think anybody in this room truly knows the answer to that question and as I said I'm not aware of a single complaint from a consumer about uh, an eyebrow threading gone bad um, you know I just don't know of one I'm not saying that there aren't any but if there are I have not seen them and so I think those are the kinds of things that from the administration side and the, certainly from the legislative side that they're going to ask. The first thing they're going to say, because they, they do not want to regulate anything that doesn't really need to be regulated. And they're not going to regulate it just because it's something that might be performed in a cosmetology shop if it doesn't, if there's not a clear risk to the harm or harm to the public. So the first question they're going to ask us is, you're bringing this to us, asking us to regulate this, now prove that we should. They're going to want, and the second question they're going to say is, how many complaints have you had about eyebrow threading's gone bad? And we're going to have to say zero. So it's going to require um, due diligence on the board's part to show that, in fact, it should be regulated, and here's why. And 
that it needs to be health, safety, and welfare, not um, because it's a process that's performed in a cosmetology shop. Commissioner, unlike the laser uh, issue that's come up, right? Because there have been complaints and right. And yeah, I, and I think there's a lot of similarities, frankly, for me between the two. Um, I think the law is unclear, and I always believe that when the law is unclear, that we should. Um, then look at health, safety, and welfare. However, certainly there are, I think logic would dictate that there are far greater risks to the public with uh, lasers gone bad than eyebrow tatters gone bad. So, um, Yes? <clears throat> well, it is harmful, number one, because threading, <coughs> excuse me, can cause cuts, and uh, <coughs> those cuts allow pathogens to get in the bloodstream. So, um, I think I know how the board feels here, and I'm just wondering, uh, since we are uh, not going to go any further with this, why can we not just make a case that we are, we, th we certainly think it should be regulated, and we think, uh, you know, the Cosmetolo Co Cosmetology Act of 1986 should actually include permanent and uh, temporary hair removal, if you will, and uh, that I don't know, maybe this panel, Madam Chairman, could, could get with the legislature some way and show how we feel about it. Well, you could certainly make a motion um, acknowledging the judge's ruling. Um, I think you would want a motion um, accepting recommendation from counsel that, that we do not pursue an appeal. And, and then in that also you could um, instruct counsel and the administration to um, prepare some language that would allow for the regulation of eyebrow threading to be presented to the legislature. We can draft that. We can present that to you at your next meeting or meeting after what, whatever meeting proceeding it being prepared. Um, and we can do that. So I, I think, and again, I, I don't want to, if Please, no one here will leave with the impression that I'm saying that eyebrow threading is not harmful. I'm not saying it is or it isn't. I'm saying, based on the evidence we have at hand, we've not had a single complaint. That doesn't mean that there won't be one. That doesn't mean that there isn't one. I'm just not aware of that. And um, so I think the judge was very clear that he feels like this was certainly a process that should be looked at for regulation. Um, Commissioner, I had a few points um, with, well, I'm probably the only board member who has received the service. And when we had the hearing here, I was the one that raised the question about the saliva on the thread. Yes, ma'am. I have received the service. It's been a while. And I personally don't believe that I received saliva from the person during the experience. But upon having the experience, I think that it is a possibility. Mm -hmm. for the saliva to be on the thread and it come down. Um, that's my first point. With respect to the complaints, um, you know, I'm from Memphis, and um, in Memphis, I don't know of any kiosks, but there may be some kiosks that offer this service, but all the places that I know in Memphis that offer this service, they're actually in storefronts. And um, some may be salons, but most of them, that's all that they're doing. And depending on who's offering the services, there may be some other cultural services being offered, like the um, tattooing. So I'm just, the temporary tattooing, the body art, I guess you could call it. So I'm just sharing information at this point. But yeah, in Memphis, they're not even in the kiosks that I know of. They're in um, storefronts, like I said. And with respect to the complaints, I have heard and I have talked to people who have had ill experiences from it, but I think that maybe they haven't complained to the board office because they don't know, mm -hmm. they don't think to make the connection that this is where they could right. complain. Right. But um, so I'm not suggesting that overall most of the experiences are, are, are negative, but I just wanted to share that feedback. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I appreciate that. And again, I think that's for you all to decide. I think the judge has handed you um, a baton to run with. And, um, you know, I think you need to decide should it be a cosmetology license or is it an 
estheticians license sufficient? Um, what level of licensing do you think um, should be required if a person wanted to open up a shop and all they did was eyebrow threading? I think that's what you need to look at, not in the context of, okay, can a full-blown cosmetologist do this? I think we all agree if, the, if we have some limited education and testing, they should be able to do that. But then what I think what you need to consider is what are the minimum requirements to do this sole process, single process, if that's all somebody wanted to do. We know, we know for a fact that there are shops out there that that is their primary business. Well, so. if that be the case, Commissioner, we would almost, to make this simple for them to be educated, Yes, and just do this particular technique, we'd almost have to create another license, wouldn't we? To make well, it I think that that's up to you again, and I think you, it would require a little bit of study um, on your part to determine the specific, the specific professional aspects. The administration is not qualified to determine what the specific professional aspects of this should be. Um, you can decide you don't want to test for it. You can decide that you don't want to educate for it. You can decide that you just want to have basic um, sanitation education for it. You can decide that you can just get an aesthetics license and you're then qualified to do this. That's up to you. Again, that's a, that's a specific professional um, component of the discussion that we shouldn't, we're just not qualified to be part of. Thank you very much for coming. Sure. I feel like you guys still have questions, though. Oh, I think we will for quite a while okay. on this. Um, I, you know, again, I would encourage you to, to uh, pass a motion that acknowledging the receipt of the judge's ruling um, and then advise counsel as, or on counsel's advice to not appeal the decision. and. Certainly, if you choose to instruct the administration to begin to prepare some language that would give you the authority to regulate the industry, um, we can certainly fine tune the professional aspects of it going forward through rulemaking. Uh, but I think it's a, the critical component right now is that you change the language in the statute, giving the board the authority to regulate the process. Um, how we specifically do that, uh, we can do through rulemaking over a little bit longer period. So, so you, you're saying that we should have a motion and vote on whether to not appeal the judge's decision. Is that what you're Council? Um, it's up to you all. The deadline to appeal is December 19th because the order was entered on the 19th of November, so there's a 30-day appeal timeline. Even if the board requested an appeal, it's ultimately up to the Attorney General's office whether to move forward with it. And since they've provided their opinion that there's not really any anything that they could find in the order or reasoning to appeal the decision because it's clearly laid out that yes, this probably should be regulated, but unfortunately in 1986 when the legislature, you know, created these laws and definitions, it wasn't something that happened in Tennessee, so they didn't take it into consideration. Thus, that is what prevents the board from regulating it um, and acknowledges that there needs to be changes. And so it's their opinion and suggestion that the board say, we'll forego an appeal and almost recommendation to the legislature that yes, there should be some regulation of this, and yes, we do need to amend our act in order to be able to do so. So if we do not even, it'll, it will be automatically accepted after the 19th of December. Yes. We don't have to. Correct. Okay. I just always think it's good business to officially acknowledge um, when you're advised by a judge. And, and the, uh, the Attorney General is, I, cer I certainly think that the Attorney General's office would feel better having an official acknowledgement from the board that you are not uh, interested in pursuing an appeal. I'd like to make a motion that we have received the judge's ruling on the eyebrow threading issue and that we as a board choose not to appeal. I second. Motion made by Ms. Coppinger, seconded by Ms. Walker, that we do not appeal. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Eyes carried. Thank you all. Commissioner, I had another question. Um, sure. We have a vacancy on the board yes, that was raised earlier. 
Um, what is the status of replacing? I can tell you that the governor's office is working diligently towards making those appointments. Beyond that, I can't say much. I'm sorry. I wish I could. I know you guys, uh, the uncertainty alone is, is uh, discomforting. So, but, and we need, we need a quorum. We need a full board. I would love to see you guys as we, I've talked with the chairman. Uh, with about some ad hoc committees and um, those kinds of things, and they're much more difficult with a a uh, short board. So uh, I can tell you though that it is a focus, and that they are working on it. So, Thank you. all right, you all. If I don't see you again, have a merry Christmas. Same to you. Yeah. Happy New Year. You too. Leanne Rampula. is an appearance before the board today to request reconsideration of her reciprocity application from New Jersey. Ms. Rampula received her 1,000 hours in the curriculum of cosmetology in 2002 and does not have proof of her work history. And I'll turn it over to her. Yes, uh, hello. I'd I like you guys speaking here. Well, I'll be okay, sorry. Um, I'm just coming before you just to reconsider. I know the state of Tennessee requires 1,500 hours, which I only have 1,000 hours coming from the state of New Jersey. Um, but I am a licensed cosmetologist. I have worked in the state of Tennessee. I have managed a shop in the state of Tennessee. I have moved here uh, eight years ago, and when I moved here, I had children, so I chose to stay home and be a mom, and now they are all in school, and I want to get back into the work field um, and just get into the state of Tennessee as a cosmetologist. So I'm not asking to, I understand if you'd like me to retake the board, but to actually go back to school, I think was a requirement, which I think is um, a little unnecessary. and. A waste of my time and the instructor's time and I it's an expense that I really don't have I need to be going to work to make money not put out money so that's did did you say that you had worked in Tennessee yes I've worked in no I haven't worked in Tennessee okay I in New Jersey I misunderstood yes yeah, no when I when I moved I heard that too, okay that yeah, no, no, no. You had worked in Tennessee and it managed to have a job. No, in New Jersey. I'm sorry. New Jersey. So, yeah, no, not in Tennessee. I, I've been a mom. When is the last time you were working, ma'am? The last time I've worked was eight years ago, so whatever that was, um, in New Jersey. Now, my only thing, now that I know the laws, I probably should have had that license transferred when I first moved here. But I wasn't quite sure if we would stay. My husband is a musician, and I thought we'd go back to New Jersey. But we have what since. What you got in Tennessee? I got the bug, actually. <laughs> we actually started a church, believe it or not. And uh, so we're here to stay. And I actually love Tennessee and would never go back to New Jersey. Do you currently uh, have a New Jersey cosmetology license? I, I, I have a current license, yes. I've, I've kept it up to date to this day because I've heard you'd have to go back to school but so I said let me keep that going and when I go back there I visit the shop that I used to work at so yeah it's current to date that license and what was our previous ruling on Did she get additional education and personally it's my contention that if someone could pass our boards then they're going to have the knowledge and information that we would have required of them to go back and get additional education. And in her case, and I've spoken to her on the phone prior to the meeting, mm -hmm. but she stressed to me that it would be a hardship for her to have to go back to school and not be able to provide for her family. So I would recommend that the board just approve her to test, to take our boards, and then if she tests, then she'll be licensed because she passed. Yeah, I mean, I have four children now, and at the reason I went to school when I was 19, so when I had my family, I wouldn't have to go to school and do all this, and I, it would it would take time away from my family, my church family, my husband, 
just to be gone because 500 hours is a pretty good amount of time of school. Madam Chairman, how many work years did she present to us? The work history. Work history. Well, you worked from what in New Jersey? You worked how long? Uh, I think it's like four years. Four New years Jersey. in New Jersey. But in that short time, I've became the manager of the salon. I can even have that person write up a letter if necessary of my work history and my work ethic and. Well, really, it does not boil down to her work history as much as, in my opinion, as it boils down to, as you said, Ms. Powell, her experience and as she's able to pass the test, that she would be qualified in our eyes. That's what it boils down to, not the five-year work history. And I just, I'm sorry, I struggle with this, that Tennessee requires 1,500 hours. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to get my life, if I'm going to get my hours in New Jersey, I only have to take 1,000. And then if I can come to Tennessee and get my license, then I, I've saved some money and time because I didn't have to go an additional 500 hours. I didn't set it up that way. I don't know why all the states are different with their requirements. Mm -hmm. But in Tennessee, it you know, states in our law book that we require fifteen hundred hours for cosmetology. Right. And so and and we have tons of people that come from Florida with twelve hundred hours asking for reciprocity. And they're three hours short as far as our hours uh, re uh, require. So But wouldn't you think don't you think that most of the hours and the training in school is actually the hands-on, the physical, the, the law and the portion is kind of just the small portion of cosmetology. Most of it is the hands-on training and the experience, which I have well over 10 years of. So I, I know the field. I just, I got the schooling in less hours, but I've had the experience in what the school's going to teach me in that short in that 500 hours it's basically I already know what they're already going to teach me I think that's what I mean by when we say our test provides everything that she'd have to know in order to test she's going to have to go and learn the Tennessee laws if that's what we're concerned about her knowing you know Tennessee rules and sanitation laws because in order for her to pass the test she's going to have to review and learn that information anyway and in she can take the test 10 times and still never pass and never be licensed if she doesn't know the information. So it's up to her as an individual to be test and become licensed. My perspective is I would hate for us to prevent her from the opportunity of passing the test and proving herself by passing the test that the board has put together for everyone to be licensed because she just can't show the work history because she's at home with children. And Failed to transfer a license, but again, it's my recommendation. Okay, back to what so, Nina was saying. What about all the people in the past that we have well, ruled that they? You know, it's up to it, the reciprocity statute is in the board's discretion. Every situation is different, and every situation is in the board's discretion. If you felt like someone had who had three hours of education because they had some crazy history of where they had taught cosmetology in their country and they knew more than everyone on the board could ever know. You could approve them if you feel like their knowledge is there. It's it's in the board's discretion and that's how the statute is written. Um, and that's just to waive examination. And here, she doesn't even want examination waived. She's asking to take the test and asking that the board not request her to go to additional school hours. So. Could I speak as an ex-officio member of the board? Please. I can't vote, but I think I can. Um, I would just like to say, and I know you guys get presented with these kinds of cases all the time. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very important for us to get people to work. That's the, from the administration side, and I know it's important to the board, too. What I would would, would be so pleased to see the board do is to say officially we're going to 
And just because you've done something in the past um, doesn't mean that you can't do something different in the future. Some sort of formula that says, you know what, if um, Mrs. Smith has worked for five years in Florida, which is a state that was brought up, it only requires 1,200 hours. She was licensed in Florida. Her family decides to move to Tennessee. She has worked for five years. You know, maybe some sort of um, equity in the fact that if she worked for five years, that at least should one year be worth 100 hours of education or 50 hours of education. I don't know what the formula would be, but I certainly think that we, sh you know, it would be beneficial to the board, beneficial to the state, certainly beneficial to the licensee if we would acknowledge and give credit for some level of work experience. Certainly, I think that practical application, practical work in the field is as beneficial, if not more beneficial. I can tell you that I learn far better by doing something than by listening to somebody else tell me how I should do something. Mm -hmm. And so I think that if we could, if the board would, I think it would streamline things, it would make things more efficient, it would give the board office some clarity when it receives reciprocity applications. If somebody truly has five years work history and can prove that, then you bequeath to the administration that we will acknowledge that, okay, five years, that is worth 50 hours a year or 100 hours a year or some formula. And because the, mo the most important thing, certainly, as we talked about with the earlier issue, health, safety, and welfare. Second, getting people to work. That's what we want to do. So, well, In the law, five years gives automatic reciprocity. Yes, ma'am. And, and I think as uh, Counselor Powers pointed out, she, she would like to go test. Um, and I think that if, if somebody's got five years of work history or, and a thousand hours and can pass the test and his family is relocating from Florida to Tennessee, we want to be a state that encourages people to come to it. And if, they, if they've got four years, five years work history, a active license in the state that they're coming from, and then can pass the test, that's a person we should want here. Attention, attention, please. Uh, we are testing the file out system, so if you need to go to the test, you can go to the All righty. So um, I think, you know, again, call, having, having someone have to go take 500 hours, 500 more hours that's been working in the field, we, just because Tennessee has more stringent requirements than other, some other states with their education doesn't mean also, I, I would just like to see us acknowledge that practical work experience. Um, in this case, the young lady said that her former shop owner, I guess, is willing to write a letter acknowledging her um, experience and things like that. I think there are ways that we can verify that somebody, you know what, of all of my programs, every program I have, 25 different programs from accountants to real estate agents to security guards to architects, engineers, of all of my programs, this is the one where if you stink at it, you're going to be DOA in a hurry because people are not going to come back to you. They're not going to come and shop. They're not going to shop and come into your shop and do business with you if you don't. If you mess their hair up or you mess up their fingers or whatever, um, and if they meet the educational requirements, which she clearly has, by being licensed in her home state, previous state, she's relocating her family to Tennessee, has and wants to go to work. Those are the kind of folks that we want to welcome, and we certainly don't want to make it difficult if there's any way we can do it. And I think that if there is absolute value in work history in lieu of education. Thank you. Madam Chair, could I address Commissioner? I knew, and with all due respect, I knew you were going to say all that. Um, <laughs> and we've been pressured for quite a while just to uh, allow people to go to work. We really have. And so I keep looking at this. This is, when I came on board, I was told to uphold the laws and rules of 
Board of Cosmetology. What we have in place for the reciprocity is, as far as the work history, is five years, you know, immediately preceding. So it's the current five-year work history, which she doesn't have. And, um, you know, I, I agree that people need to go to work. But if somebody moves here from um, New Jersey or some other state and wants to teach elementary school, and they don't have the requirements, the hours, it, uh, they're not going to be able to do that. And I, I, I'm, I'm just using that as an analogy because why did we say to start with we need 1,500 hours in our curriculum? That's what Tennessee put in place. And if we waive 500 hours, then why are we going to waive 300 for everybody that moves from Florida and just say, take a test? Well, um, we could have a discussion about the 1,500 hours. We probably don't want to have that discussion here today, but we are one of the states that has is on the extreme end of educational requirements. Right. I knew um, that, yeah. Whether that's good or bad, uh, I think that depends where you stand. I think that's, again, I'm, I will ask council, does the board in the scenario presented here have the discretion to allow the applicant to test? Absolutely, and that's the part of the reciprocity application statute is for the board to waive testing. Here, she's applied through reciprocity, and the board has put an additional burden on her to go back to school and said, plus you have to test. And that's something that I personally have never understood. The reciprocity statute doesn't say, we'll deny your application and then tell you you have to go back to school. The reciprocity statute simply says you can apply through reciprocity and the board can accept to waive the testing requirement. And here, she's applied through reciprocity and the board has said go back to school and then test instead of just saying no, you have to take the test. So I never, from the beginning of when I came in, <coughs> understood when the board saying go and get additional education because there's nothing in the reciprocity statute that says that. What it's simply what people applying in order to waive testing because they have a license in another state. Well, since she doesn't have the current five-year work history, which is part of our reciprocity uh, um, requirements, um, what it says is she had, it has substantially met the qualification qualifications and that's where we got all hung up before on subs what is substantially you well, know and again and, and that's, and we're I'll, talking about the hours here I don't want to draw specifically her her case into my my initial comments about the education is I would like to encourage the board to consider some sort of formula that says you know what if you've worked for four years in another state that um, that that is recognized um, it's some ratio toward educational hours for states that don't require 1,500 hours. I think it is, uh, there are plenty of cosmetologists coming from states that require fewer hours that have been working for 25 years and they're going to come to Tennessee and because we require 500 more hours of education, we're going to require them to go take 500 hours and go back to school and then test. All's I'm, all I'm trying to say is recognize give some credit for work history practical work history hands-on work history and require a test if somebody can do that has worked in the field um, let's not penalize a successful professional coming from another state um, by because our statute is more stringent than the statute of the state that they're coming from unnecessarily can I say something? Um, Absolutely. <clears throat> isn't the whole point of getting the education is so that we can, sorry, the whole point of going to school and getting an education is so that we can pass the board, correct? So if, if I can pass the board, obviously I have the education, I know the state laws, I, ha I, I know the information to be a licensed cosmetologist. Just and so and it, like she said, if if I don't pass, then obviously I'm not going to be licensed. I won't be working. So that's my case. 
and you know, I would venture to say most of you probably learn more your first month actually working in a shop than you learn the entire time you were in school. And again, we're not trying to discount uh, the work history or the the um, you know hands-on mm -hmm. because we have that in place. That if you have a current five-year work history, and I think the industry changes like education changes, so that's why they put in there the current. Because if you haven't worked in 10 years, 8 years, or whatever, that a lot of things may have changed. And that maybe that's why they put in there to start with that it was the current five-year work history. Well, I agree. But you all don't have any continuing education requirements as far as I'm aware. Oh, yeah. Is that? Oh, yeah. For, for instructors. For, only for instructors. But not for, not for Which, unlike most programs, most programs actually require ongoing continuing education. So, um, and again, working in the field, um, I think, absent ongoing continuing education by the cosmetologist is better so we want to get people to work certainly I know you do, you all do too you do have discretion I think that discretion is a good thing I think that the board um, can really help uh, the state of Tennessee by using that discretion in a way that gets people to work and protects the safety and uh, welfare of the public and I think there's a, a way to do both Is there any more discussion? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, I see all of the the sides, um, and I'm a licensed cosmetologist and instructor. And I was thinking about what, how would I feel about you know colleagues who were able to come in and, and just test without without the hours. Um, but we nothing. We, we can't wipe away. Any, any of the things that we deal with and we never know what's going to come in the future but but this this reciprocity as well as the, the natural hair um, and the threading I'd rather see an act hot committee addressing the reciprocity more so than the threading because we keep dealing with um, these reciprocity cases and I appreciate your due diligence um, and I'm clear on what the law says and I'm for upholding the law but there are but I have a problem with denying people the right to work and to say that um, you know give me your money or I'm going to take it that might be an extreme analogy but I don't want to feel like we're being bullied into giving people reciprocity either but um, a lot of people are out here working without the license. So, so to me, what is the importance of the license? If the license is that important, then I think we should be able to try to help people get their license. Because there's so many people who are working without a license. So if they're working without a license, they're not paying the, the, the fee to get the license and that's taking revenue from this revenue that the state would have and then these persons may not be filing their taxes on the income and that's that's also revenue but um, I would just like to see th this gray area become a smaller area as far as our discretion versus the clear cut interpretation of the law, whatever whatever that is. But personally, as I mentioned in a, another meeting, we are under commerce and commerce deals with, with the money, with the revenue. And whenever we can help people work, I think we should help people work. And we're supposed to be, that's why we're here, we're supposed to be able to, um, you know, use discernment and, and just come up with the best decisions under the circumstances. But I do value the education. Um, but like you said, we have the 1,500 hours. That's that's more so than than most 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 states. And then with the natural hair, it's only 300, and that's underserved because people are not being adequately trained to do that craft because that curriculum is just underserved, but with respect to the reciprocity, I would like to see an ad hoc committee address reciprocity even more so than um, the threat. 
because we continue to deal with reciprocity and we're going to continue to deal with reciprocity but um, it's just that the gray area is just too big. We need to do something to try to, to narrow this scope. Thank you. Thank you. Well, at this point in time, we've got this young lady in, uh, in front of us, but also uh, I would like to appoint a committee to work on this, on the reciprocity. And I'm, at, forgive me, I'm going to do this before I, anything else. I would like to ask and say yes or no if you would serve on the committee, one being Ms. Walker. Yes. One being... Ms. Kupinger? Yes. Is there one of the other members that would desire to be on it? Don't everyone raise their hand at one once. Time. I need three people for sure. We have such a big okay. board. Ms. Oh, Ms. Smith? Okay. Could you work with the three of you, maybe phone calling or something? Because I know we, everyone lives so far away from each other. Let me, can I determine how to get together an ad hoc committee with legal, and then I'll contact each of the three of you separately to let you know? Because it may be that we have to have something public. Yes, you do, um, and you want to be careful not to violate any. I don't want you calling each other about legal matters because we don't want we don't want to break the open meetings. <clears throat> Right. Yeah. So, well, see, in the past, we never could do anything like that because of the expense. Well, well, we we will uh, we'll determine what the best way is because other boards have ad hoc committees and they meet before board meetings and board meetings occur at say noon and the ad hoc committees meet in the morning, so it's not a, necessarily an extra expense. So, or the I day before, to, or the day after, right? Or the day before, or the day after. Um, so I need to look and see how that's done in order before anybody calls anybody or does anything. And then we'll get some sort of agenda together. Okay. We have plenty of time to do that because the next meeting is not until February. We'll make sure you get funded. <laughs> Thanks, sir. We'll make sure you get funded. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that has been an issue. No, I, I agree. And I think certainly I, I appreciate you even notice, uh, noticing that. And it, you guys, uh, I'm glad that you watched the money. But these, this is important stuff, and we will make sure that uh, you know that you're able to pay for it and, uh, okay now back to the present situation uh, we have Ms. Rampula we have discussed this back and forth I know we have different opinions um, is there any more discussion at all on this. I know we're going to work on getting the gray area smaller. I understand that. And it yeah, was wonderful what you brought up. Uh, but today is today. Now we've got to work with this issue. And until this committee comes up with something that we might agree on as a whole, we have to individually take each scenario. So right now we're back to where we were with Ms. Rampula. Last month. Do you have in front of you have any we asked to go back and, and take additional hours? Do I have how many I can look back on the minutes we just approved? Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, how many additional hours we requested? How many people? How many oh, how many individuals? The first one had um, 660 hours on esthetician on page four. Mm -hmm. uh, we allowed her to sit for the exam. The second one is Ms. Rampula. The third one, esthetician. Uh, required to take 390 more hours. 
from Virginia, 150 more hours. Massachusetts had a thousand hours, required 500 more hours. Five. Ma'am? I just skimmed through. There's five total that the board had requested to get to have additional hours. Not including this revenue. We had a similar situation back a few years ago, maybe it's been a year, or year and a half ago, I can't remember the exact time. <clears throat> when we made a transition uh, on requiring extended, I mean, uh, the education for the seminars for the instructors, and we changed it to whenever the license expired versus every other year. Mm -hmm. Do you guys remember that? Mm -hmm. Yes. And it took us a, a while to get that, you know, really rolling better. Mm -hmm. But the situation I'm bringing up is we had to go back for a couple of people and they appeared before the board and reversed our decision on allowing them the extension. I know you weren't here then, but uh, that makes sense. But we we chose a certain amount of, and I cannot remember, a certain amount of months that we were went back to change our decisions on. And I think it was like two or three months. I can't remember. But you see, that was another situation similar to this that really required some planning out because mm -hmm. you can't just stop right here like the other four last month. more discussion? Thoughts? Would we go back and change that for all the rest of them? Is that what would, what's the suggestion on that? She was just saying once the ad hoc committee gets together and determines the process, that it would be something that the board would look at to determine if the past decision should be reviewed. Is that correct? But definitely. Generally, I think that um, boards have, have not uh, gone backwards and undone specific decisions regarding applicants. Uh, in a case like this, I think they would they would mostly uh, expect the applicant to come back before the board again. You might make uh, some sort of public notice that the board had in fact changed its position or updated or revised its position. And then if those applicants were to come before the board again, you might reconsider that. As far as the board um, uh, having a uh, concerted effort to reach back out, I mean that's an endless, an endless operation. You, I mean, at what point do you say, okay, we're only going to go back to 2010 or to 2004? Um, so I think you'd have to leave the responsibility of uh, applicants. Uh, it is no different than changing a law. So. I don't <clears throat> want to tell you how to run the board or whatever, but a suggestion too could be, you know, go and take the test so many times like maybe two times and if you don't pass then you're required to go back and get additional education for so many hours like if I was short the 500 then obviously you don't know what needs to be done so you need to go for your 500 hours I think that's a great suggestion 
that way, because the, our test is state developed. And because our test is state developed, that means we put the test together, not the NIC. Um, and so we put that test together with my understanding that it meets the curriculum. And I have people come to me on a weekly basis that say how hard and difficult our test is and how often they do not pass it and what can I do in order to pass the test. And I've had to look at the PSI booklets and learn more about it myself. Um, but, you know, if, if we did say you have two, two times to pass the test and if you don't, the board's going to require you get the missing education, I think that that's a, a fallback on your decision. Well, how you know? many times have they taken other than people taken it about three times? You can take it as many times as you but want. But no, I say have people. That was Oh, one. yes. Mm -hmm. Over three times? I've had people come to me and say it's been years. <laughs> They've been trying to pass it for years. Is there anything they can do? My head is spinning. But I, as I'm sitting here thinking all, all this through, and I see all the, I really do see all the sides of it. Um, and I see that you're missing, according to our laws, you're missing a third of the education. People that come from Florida are missing a fifth of the education. But I like I like what you just said, but I would say if we if so I'll, I'm, I do like solutions to any kind of problem. This seems to be a problem for the board because we have this reciprocity issue all the time. So if um, I would be willing to entertain the idea that we would say we would make a motion. I'm not making a motion right now, but that we would say, okay, you can take the Tennessee state exam once if you don't pass it then you are required to go back and take the additional hours the 500 hours and then take the exam the second time that's a good idea and that i mean sense. we could implement that for everybody but i i don't see giving them a second chance on the test i say if you if you can pass the test the first time great and it then that see that does offer kind of a compromise here <laughs> And I, believe it or not, I do like to compromise. But uh, she's been sitting over here thinking real hard. I'll tell you that. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. So, uh, but th I mean, that would that might be a suggestion that we offer. Okay, we'll let you stick for the Tennessee exam. But if you don't pass it, then you go back and you take the required uh, 500 hours. No ifs, ands, or buts. So you take the required 500 hours, and then you take the Tennessee exam to be licensed. I, I mean, I'm just offering that up as a Compromise. That's a, that's a very, wonderful. very good solution. <laughs> Let's you make a deal. deal. I, I like that deal. <laughs> I will pass. Have you studied Tennessee uh, law book and Tennessee's? Right. I will study all of Tennessee's laws and get that under <clears> my <throat> belt, which, no problem. Do you have a copy of the law book? I do. I got that. A hard book. copy of the inner. You know, one on the, the internet. internet is internet. very different. Good, because if you had a hard copy, I'd be surprised. Yeah, I don't know. Because they don't exist much. <laughs> yeah, can I just say one thing, too? Before, um, I, I don't want the board to get the impression that we want unqualified people to get a free pass at all. I want to get qualified people to work as fast as we can. And I think that's sometimes in these... In these um, condensed discussions it's hard to adequately articulate that and I have to take my extreme position against your extreme position to try to rush to to a conclusion and I wish we had more time to discuss this in much greater detail because I think there are I absolutely understand and appreciate the board's position and um, I think there's there is compromise and I think that there is everybody's position has um, validity and I think that we can work together. Um, some of the things that we're doing with the administration side, I think, are going to make this the best program in regulatory boards. I truly believe that. And I think along with that, doing some of the things that you're talking about with the ad hoc committees, going back and looking at your statutes, what can we do to improve it and make it better and make it better for your licensees and make it better for the public, um, it's going to make this program great. It really is. I believe it. And um, it's all, and it all works together. Um, so, I think that's a good point, and I think the the word qualified, if she can pass the Absolutely. Tennessee state exam, then we feel like 
that she's qualified but I think by adding that if someone can't then the, they automatically go back and do what we required you know to absolutely start so absolutely and that was my point with the work edu I think if you have not I mean, you know what there's lots of people that can work in someone in 20 years and never learn a thing there's other people that can work in some two years and learn everything that somebody who worked for 20 years might not have learned so I think it's I think that is a terrific um, position to take that if somebody does have a verifiable work history a valid license in another state and they want to become a Tennessean we should at least give them a shot to take the test and prove to us prove to you that in fact they are worthy of having that license and I think that's a fantastic um, recommendation well I'd like to make a motion madam chair please do okay uh, since miss Rampula does hold a valid uh, cosmetology license in another state um, I would like to make a motion that she sit for the Tennessee cosmetology exam and uh, if she passes the exam she's uh, granted reciprocity if she does not pass the exam she's required to go back to school for 500 hours and then take retake the Tennessee state cosmetology exam do I hear a second Motion made by Ms. Coopinger, second by Ms. Walker, that Ms. Rampula sit for the Tennessee exam and pass the exam and will receive her Tennessee license. If not, if she does not pass, she will go back to school for 500 hours and retake the Tennessee exam. All in favor say aye and speak loudly on the aye. aye. All in favor say aye. 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 All in, not approved, say nay. Eyes win. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We're hard headed. <laughs> We've got a lot. I did not pay him to be here. We've got a lot. We've got to work on. Yes. As a board, we know that. And everything's not black and white. It's not black and white. And I think, and, and we want to work with you as we as I Good said. Good luck. Thank you so much. You'll get a letter from the board confirming everything. As I said when I came before you two months ago and talked about the director situation, we're cracking this can open. Let's just crack the whole thing open. Let's crack it all open and decide what we can do to make this the best board in the regulatory division of the state of Tennessee. I really think we can. You are my largest program. You have, you have more licensees than any other program I have, and you have more licensees than most of my other programs combined. And um, we have we are making some terrific improvements to the day-to-day -day operation down there and doing these kinds of things will only help let's let's look at what can we do to make it as efficient and as effective and as Ms. Coppinger said getting the best most qualified people we we are we should be excited about anybody moving from another state wanting to become a Tennessean and it's a it's like a cold blanket cold wet blanket when you find out I get there I've been working in my profession not specifically cosmetology but any profession you find out I've been working for five years in my profession in my home state and you come here and are presented with these roadblocks so but the key word as you said I think it was I'm very I'm I'm excited about the decision that you all made because I think it's it's logical it's considerate and but getting qualified people to work as fast as we can that's what we want to do and I think that's your goal that's our goal and that's man we can run down that track together so, thank y'all thank you, thank you. Uh, Leticia DePava I, I have nothing left <laughs> <laughs> Miss DePava is here with her son-in-law Lewis today to request consideration to present new information related to her reciprocity application and her work history. Ms. DePava's education has previously been approved by the board and she was approved to take the Tennessee exam. Ms. DePava is requesting the board reconsider approval of her application for reciprocity from Columbia by proof of her work history shown. Um, on your iPad you'll see Ms. DePava's reciprocity application which is dated back in 2011 and her information she has presented a letter to the board to reconsider and then after her letter there are several affidavits signed and in English along with their 
untranslated copy in Spanish and each individual's information attached to the letter which details her work history in Colombia and it's basically a letter of recommendation. She has shown previously by tax records four years of work history and then with an affidavit of her CPA that the fifth year couldn't be accounted for because if you don't make over a specific amount you are not required to file taxes in Colombia and this information was previously presented for the board. The board requested her to take the exam. They've approved her education as presented. She has 30 years of work history pursuant to these documents and her letter and she has shown previously that it's a hardship for her to test because she is limited in her English language knowledge and I'll turn it over to you. And, uh, Hello, in your name, sir? My name is Louis Molina. I'm okay. I should say her son in law. Um, but I also would like to add that uh, we also submitted another um, license from the uh, from from Colombia stating that her salon is there for 19 years. Okay. And, and there's um, pictures of her uh, in, in the back of this package, too. Uh, and they're actually scanned in any color. Uh, figured out I could do that. <laughs> Yes. Of her practicing, uh, which I suggested to show, you know, her work history that she practiced, and I suggested they submit these affidavits as well, you know, showing her work history for the board's consideration because all we previously had was tax documentation. And so these are all letters of recommendations from attorneys and CPAs from Columbia, and they are all uh, signed, and then there's a translated copy and a Spanish copy attached there too, <coughs> along with the license information. Very attractive pictures. Mm -hmm. We have a, in, in her file should be also a uh, Chamber of Commerce from Barranquilla where it states that uh, her salon is there uh, since April of 1992. Uh, that's when she got received this license until uh, December 2010 is when we uh, uh, got the paperwork because and she moved here in uh, February, January or February 2011. That's when uh, she put in her application. And if I may, I would like to read the letter that um, she's composed yes. for today. Because so to we've been here before, I just want to, for those that are new as well, it says, um, Dear Board of Cosmetology, this letter is in my ongoing commitment to obtain my cosmetology license in Tennessee. I already made my argument that I have been a cosmetologist in my native country of Columbia, South America. I have submitted my hours and was accredited by this board to take the cosmetology exam. The application I submitted was not to take the exam, rather to be granted a license based on my 30 year of experience. I also made my argument that at my 65 years of age, it is impossible for me to learn English to the magnitude of being able to- Lean a little closer to that. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, it's impossible for me to learn English to the magnitude of being able to pass a test in that language. The last time I met with the board, I was shown compassion when the board told me that it was going to be, it was going to make an arrangement to, to give me the test in my native language. To my uh, dissolution, shortly after, I received a cold letter stating that I was denied for my license with no other explanation. This process has been ongoing for almost two years, two years that I have been as though my hands have been tied, depending on others financially. I am de determined not to be a burden to the state and have not received any kind of governmental assistance. My goal is to be a productive part of society with your help. If I already attached to this letter, you will find pictures for affidavits from three reputable lawyers and an accountant in Colombia, <coughs> excuse me, who bear witness that in fact I have been a legal and active cosmetologist for over 25 years prior to submitting my application. This without a doubt should be more than enough to qualify for reciprocity under the Tennessee Cosmetology Laws and Rules Section 62 for 116 reciprocity license without examination. Under this law, I have to show only five years, and I have, with this evidence and other papers submitted, which include tax papers, that without a doubt this law was made to license and empower people like me. Thank you for your help. Thank you for your hand, uh, beforehand, for your attention and consideration in this matter. She says she wants to say something as well. Okay. You have to lean real close, ma'am. 
Uh, come to this country not to be a burden to the state she said I'm, I'm of age but I'm an active and I want I want to work I want to uh, do my art and I don't want to work without my license yes, so, and that will help me not to be a burden to the state And she's 65. 65. Madam Chair, can I just ask uh, Ms. Powers for a clarification? She, uh, she's asking us to waive the test right. and be granted reciprocity. And she has, uh, does she have a current five-year work history, proof of current five-year work history in front of us? She does, yes, but this has been presented to the board for approval before, so administration doesn't have the ability to uh, approve anything. It has to come back to the board if they present new information. Excuse me. So we, as a board, decided that she would just need to sit for the test. Yes. And then she received a letter. Well, I'm, I'm not sure about the letter previously since it was before I was in uh, looking over all of these all the time, so that's her intention saying yes. But. I will try to piece some of it together because I had some limited knowledge of this case um, after uh, pretty early on. The and we were asked uh, the first time I became aware of this case is we, when we were asked could we give the test in Spanish. That still remains a question that we don't have a specific answer to. We very much would like to give the test in Spanish. However, it's not just as easy as hitting a translate button and having that done. Aside from that, um, the particulars in this case for me were she presented initially what I considered to be uh, five years of work history. Making enough money to pay taxes does not necessarily mean that you didn't work, uh, as I can attest to, because I've made, there were plenty of years when I was a younger person where I didn't make enough money to pay taxes and didn't mean I didn't work. Um, and so, however, and her accountant verified that she had in fact worked. She would paid taxes for four or five years. She'd worked for 19 years. She has now received an additional letter, as I understand, is that correct, Counselor? Um, additional affirmation or affidavit of the fifth year? Oh, that, there's just several affidavits of all the years she's been practicing. So it wasn't so, necessarily affirmation of the fifth year. It was affirmation of her work history for 30 years, basically. Right. So, so based on the additional information as presented, um, that that is, and because as Councilor Power said, because the board had rendered a previous decision, it was not within the authority of the administration to summarily approve um, the, her application with the new information. Even if it had been presented in that fashion initially, we would have been able to do that. But because you all had ruled on it previously, um, we you we felt you needed to hear the case again, hear the new, see the new evidence of her work history. Um, so. And I think, you know, I, I, we would very much, had it come through with the information that we have in hand now, um, based on the counselor's recommendations, we would have approved the license administratively and the board would not have had to deal with that. So. Do you have a, does she have a job pending? Yes. She can look that up and then. Yes, she does. Can, can I also, aren't you a licensed? Yes, and, and this is something I said before. I'm a licensed barber. Her daughter is a licensed cosmetologist as well. So okay. it runs in our blood. <laughs> He's a licensee. So. Yes. But I think what, uh, I th I'm pretty sure that the reason we made the uh, uh, ruling before or um, the decision before is, you know, like Commissioner uh, Giannini said we're, we're looking for qualified make, making sure that in our profession we have qualified people and since she got her education outside of the United States that's why and we've done this in a lot of cases we have required that she take the Tennessee exam and now the hang up is that we don't give the exam 
in any other language except English, and that's been a problem for some people um, before as well. Um, yes, and we're, we're, the, administratively, we are going to work on that. We are working on that now. I think it is absolutely um, imperative on us to be able to offer that test um, in other languages. I think, however, in this specific case, we feel like that with the new evidence um, that she has presented, she would have met the reciprocity requirements of the five-year work history. Um, unfortunately, the, the initially, the four years out of the five of the ta not paying taxes for one of the years out of the five um, led the board to believe that, well, that doesn't verify five years' work history. They have since gone back and, we believe, provided credible evidence that, in fact, she has well in excess of five years' work history. That's a separate um, issue from the board, the administration, being able to provide the test in Spanish. We are working on that. We certainly don't want to hold up people who um, are qualified to go to work um, from going to work in the state of Tennessee because we can't offer the test in our native language. Um, I think I will say that the, in their case, they have worked very, very hard. Um, they have been very, very honest, very, very forthright and very, very consistent in maintaining that they are not going to work without a license. And I think that's admirable. Uh, when we do, I think, as as Miss um, Walker said earlier, we have so many people, especially in this profession, who are out working without licenses. And so I think it's it's commendable that they that they feel that uh, having that license is so important. I admire her for wanting to work at the age of 65. I, do I know the feeling. I do too. I admire them. My, my grandparents were immigrants, and my grandfather could barely speak English. So I, I admire them all the way around. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion. Yes, ma'am. Um, based on the uh, fact that she has proven that she has current five-year-plus work history, um, I would like to make a motion that we grant reciprocity. Do I hear a second to that motion? Thank you, Mr. Motion is made by Ms. Coppinger, seconded by Mr. Herford, that we grant reciprocity. Um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Ayes carry. Reciprocity without a test. Thank you. So this is what she's done all her life. <laughs> she wants to do it until she dies. Oh, good luck. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being such a good citizen. Thank you. Are you leaving us? <laughs> May we take a break before administration? Absolutely. Break. Oh. Getting between each other and working together, and I love it. And I'll turn the meeting over to our attorney. Okay. Well, our, our administrator. Yes. Our administrator attorney. L little above. We are on the administrative report applications for examination for the board to approve the, the required information disclosure from the student letter of examination from the school is all submitted for Thrive Hamilton, Maddie Hardeman, and Teresa Wiseman. Just need a motion to approve each application for examination with a signed agreed order with a two year probationary period. I make a motion that we um, accept with a signed agreed order and a two year probationary period. Second. Motion made by Ms. Coppinger, seconded by Ms. Smith, that we agree uh, with the consent. <laughs> um, I'll bring you some time. Agreed order. And a two-year probation. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes carry. We have an instructor seminar extension request next for the 2011 instructor seminar for Irma Tate to extend to 2013 due to health issues of her daughter experienced in childbirth. And she submitted a letter to Miss Betty, actually. And it's on your iPads, which talks about her daughter's health issues.
and she's just now riding in 12. Yes. But she's sure peeing in 11. Yes. And also in your iPads is our printout from our <coughs> RBS system, which shows that she should have attended in 2011 in the history of her attendance, along with the letter that we sent her in November <coughs> asking for submission of her 2011 certificate. So she received her license in 10? Am I correct? Her instructor license? She's been in rank as an instructor since 1998. She's oh, been licensed since 1983 as a cosmetologist. And this just shows her history. Our screen only provides so much. She went in a 305, 07, and 09, and she was due to go again in 2011. Okay, she went and when, ma'am? 09. She was due to go in 2011, and this letter is requesting to wait until 213 because she missed it in well, that's over a year. Well, if I would turn my page, I would have seen that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> is it over a year? Yeah, it's over yes, a year later. Yes, she's late. With a... Uh, uh, <coughs> excuse. And she didn't think about it until she got the letter from the state. <clears throat> Why didn't she go in 12? I'm not she sure. She didn't think about it. <laughs> See, she got the letter from state on the November the 2nd. Or 12. That's why. And she's supposed to have gone in 11. It doesn't even say when this baby was born. Right. Since we're all being so good today, <laughs> we'll make a motion we give her the benefit of a doubt and let her send us the, this doctor's report of when that baby was born and all of this stuff. I'm going to put that in the form of a motion. Okay. <laughs> motion is made by Ms. Smith, seconded by Ms. Wormsley, that we request that she provides more information on the timing on the birth of the baby and any information she can give us. And then we'll make a decision. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes carry. Bless you. Bless you. Excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, next we have a request for reinstatement of her instructor license by Lakeitha Carter. Ms. Carter had requested for her instructor status to be extended back in October's board meeting and the board denied her request. She has sent in a letter that states that she had spoken with Ms. Waller and Ms. Waller had previously advised her that she was supposed to attend the 2012 instructor continuing education course and she did so and she I've spoken with her and she's quite upset about this. She paid to come to the Nashville seminar. She got a hotel. She paid for the seminar. She went in 2012. And because it had been so long, we denied her extension request regardless of the fact that she had gone in 2012. And she contends that Ms. Waller had said, you can go in 2012 and you're, you will be extended. But unfortunately, she was due to go in 11 and since she waited to go in 12 her instructor status fell off so she's requesting because of the fact that she states she talked to Ms. Waller Ms. Waller told her she could go in a, in 2012 that um, she be reinstated because she has gone to the core so. and her license does not expire until 14 correct so the board could, my recommendation would be to reinstate her and request her to go in 2013 and she'd be up to date. Yeah. My question is, this, would that have been the information that she probably received anyway? Because usually when we 
make these exceptions in a case like this is they use they usually have to do the two years back to back. Right. So I'm wondering, wondering if what Miss Waller told her was to attend twelve and thirteen. I'm not sure. I generally present them all for approval if they haven't gone before because in the board office, if they don't go and they can't show proof before we can issue their license, it either has to fall off or they have to show proof that they've gone or the board has to waive that they go until the next year and we can't issue their license without doing so. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Because we don't process the <coughs> renewal for an instructor if the requirements haven't been met. And her right. money and everything is done in right. and everything right. is... Mm -hmm. So in this case, she was due to go in 11, because she went in 09, and she went in 2012. And if we reinstated <coughs> it, if and she attended 13... She'd be up to date. I make a motion that we reinstate the instructor license and require her to go in 2013. I second. Motion made by Ms. Coverture, second by Ms. Smith, uh, that we reinstate her and she attend 2013. All in favor say aye. 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 Ayes carry. Okay. Next we have applications for reciprocity. And first we have Nika Alicia. Mika is a student from Puerto Rico applying for a, I'm sorry, I looked at hers, it's a little different. She's applying for a manicurist license and she has 780 hours and her transcript is shown <coughs> which provides 780 hours and it's a certified transcript. I would recommend, considering she doesn't have a license and her hours are met, that she just be required to test. Because technically she could have made an application to simply test with the certification of education. She just applied via reciprocity. Yeah, I make a motion that she take the Tennessee manicures exam. Second. Motion made by Ms. Coopinger, seconded by Ms. Smith, that she take the ten uh, Tennessee manicure exam. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed nay. Aye scared. Next we have an application for reciprocity of cosmetology license for Elizabeth Barfield. Her certification, her certification from Florida verifies 1,200 hours of instruction in the cosmetology curriculum along with a letter from her previous employer where she worked as an apprentice from July 13th of 2011 to August 31st of 2012. Here we are. I praise Florida. Uh -huh. Okay, I'm going to make a motion. You don't have to agree with this. Remember that. But my motion is that she sit for the Tennessee ex exam, and if she does not pass it, she's required to go back to school for 300 hours and take the Tennessee exam again. Motion made by Ms. Coopinger, seconded by Ms. Smith, that she sit for the Tennessee exam, and if she does not pass it, go back to school for 300 hours. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes carry. Okay. Next we have Jennifer Connor. She is requesting reconsideration before the board along with an additional work history submitted for a reciprocity application. She was, at, she has a thousand hours from Massachusetts which was in 02. She is a cosmetologist manager and that license came into effect in 2004. You have to have two years work experience in order to be a licensed manager in the state of Massachusetts and um, her certification verifies 1,000 hours of instruction in the cosmetology curriculum and her date of first licensure. And the board previously voted that she be required to complete 500 hours in the <coughs> Tennessee exam, and now she's provided uh, work history, which is attached in here. It's kind of hard to see. Is it a current five-year work history? It seems to me to be. It's She has several W-2s from several different places. 
but La Vida Bella in 08, Tropez also from 08 to 2010, um, and then she it looks like she was a partner there, and uh, she also has a 09 as a stylist, a W2 from Tropez, which is a salon, and then in 2010, which is also, she was at Tropez, it seems like she worked at a Forella Tramatazzi Incorporated, then TC Makeup, which is a makeup agency in 2011, Renew Beauty and Med Spa as well in 2011, um, England LLC, which is Planet Beach Tanning Salon in 2011. I think she's a contract type person. She, that's the way she explained it to me. So she has a bunch of those to choose from a couple of different places. And then she also had applied through Reciprocity in California and they had approved her and she attached an email showing their approval which also states that she would have to test to be granted Reciprocity from California. And a letter from her as well. Does she hold a current Cosmetology license yes. from Massachusetts, is that where? Or? It's out 12 and 28 and 20 in Florida. Oh, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. So she has a current license? Yes, she does. I make a motion that she t take the Tennessee, uh, Tennessee Cosmetology exam, and if she does not pass it, she is required to go back to school for 500 hours and take the Tennessee exam again. I second. Motion made by Ms. Goodmanger, seconded by Ms. Walker, that she take the Tennessee exam, and if she does not pass it, she goes back to school for 500 more hours. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes carry. That was for how many hours to go back? 500. Okay. <clears throat> Next we have Dang Du. This one's quite interesting. When we receive this as you can see on the application, it was previously approved on 9-6 of 2012, but some of those that were previously approved, we vetted. And um, this is a manicurist reciprocity application from Texas with 600 hours. Texas certification um, says that she was a manicurist and was approved by examination. But when we put her information into our system, she was previously issued a license which was revoked pursuant to information Georgia provided us that individuals uh, listed on the memo that's included in your information obtained licenses fraudulently. And her name is actually highlighted as number 13. Unfortunately, when you scan in the highlighted version, it kind of blacked out her name. Mm. And then there's a newspaper ad that deals with the bribery charges in Georgia <laughs> along with a 1994 memo to the attorney at that time that states that uh, cosmetology board office in Georgia had granted certain applicants licenses and the individuals noted the licenses were authentic but other individuals licenses were obtained through fraud. They it was my understanding they forged the paperwork to obtain the licenses. So you can see I put our printout of our system in the iPads, which states <coughs> that uh, she would need to go before the board if she ever applied again because of this information. So it seems that she does meet our reciprocity, <coughs> but because she had previously been revoked by the board, she has to go before your approval. Now I contacted her because I wanted her to make a statement about this and to present it to the board. So it's the last thing in your package under her name. And she says that she basically didn't know when she did this. It was my understanding that her friend told her in order to get your license here, you just have to pay these people and they'll send you a license. And that's the way she thought you did it, is her contention. She didn't know you actually had to go to school to get a license. She thought you just paid somebody and they sent you your license and she regrets that she did it and she's asking that the board forgive her so she can move um, to Tennessee with her husband and her two children in order to work here. We had a lot of trouble back in the and you remember. I was going to say, I think we've heard this story before. Uh -huh. so. <coughs> I think 
think it's and it was just doing something that Texas. you didn't know that it was wrong and all right. that. In this case, it was Georgia licenses oh, okay. uh, that were forged and all the information <clears throat> was from Georgia. And it actually took me a long time to figure out <laughs> why she was revoked and why she was already in her system. So. Had she not been in our system, she would have just been automatically approved. What is she requesting? Reciprocity license for manicure. <clears throat> I don't see how we can do that with all that going on. Mm -hmm. She had a license and then we revoked it, I remember. Right, and it was in 1994, so it's been 15 plus years since all of this happened. That's why I contacted her and had her submit a statement, which is on your iPad, because I knew you would want to hear from her directly. Has she ever appeared before the board? I don't think she has. Mm -hmm. She paid a thousand dollars in 04 <clears throat> consent order. Right, and we looked into that 1004, and I can't find any legal case file for it, and the legal department couldn't find anything either. So I'm not sure if that note was just made on the wrong licensee, but it was, this has been a trying trial, because <coughs> I've done a lot of research. <coughs> you read that way back in that from 94, September 2, from Miss Griffith, when she started right. the letter. When, which one was Right, that? she was revoked in 1990. Mm hmm For Miss Griffin. But I did call Texas to verify that the certification was this is from Georgia. Mm -hmm. was an actual certification <coughs> at the school that they were certifying and they said yes, this is a true and correct certification. She does have six hundred hours from Texas, so she needs our reciprocity, but you know, because of her history, why is it going to be <coughs> Somebody in the, on the board was uh, selling their license, and, and they, they they've been fired mm -hmm. and arrested. And arrested, and right. It was in 1994. It's been some time. Two years. It's a long time. So she's wanting reciprocity. Is that what she? Yes, she's asking? reapplying. And she has the hours, mm -hmm. but when do we have any kind of work history? No, I mean she, she didn't provide any work history. She <coughs> meets the hourly license requirement by Texas with her 600 hours, so she didn't need to provide any work history. Could we, if we issued this, could we flag her file? We could. Uh, 
We could have her agree to a probationary period, like we do the agreed felonies, if that's something you'd want to do. A two-year probationary period. Wouldn't she need to take the exam? If she needs reciprocity, so she wouldn't need to take the exam. Well, I'm saying that because of all the problems with her oh, well, that's in the past. Well, I would think that because I don't know when the last time she worked. Right. Well, it comes right down to how can you be sure if you don't have it on paper. Let's see. Her Texas, uh, <coughs> she's currently licensed in Texas. She doesn't expire until 2012. And she was licensed by exam in Texas. 2012. December 31st. Yeah, she was licensed in 1999 in Texas and it's current until December 31st of 2012 and she was licensed by exam pursuant to her Texas certification. She was licensed by exam in Texas? Yes. Okay. Letters touching. For the exam. I second. Motion is made by Ms. Huckleby and seconded by Ms. Walker that she sit for the Tennessee exam. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed nay. Ayes carry. Okay. Next we have Ru Reuben Elijah Ruaz. The application is for reciprocity of the cosmetology license issued on June 14, 2011 from New York where she qualified by equivalent experience from Mexico. She has submitted a translated transcript of her hairstylist information from Mexico which verifies 1,400 hours of instruction and she does not have a five-year work history. 1,400 hours? Yes. And she has her license in New York? Yes. And they accepted reciprocity without an exam? Yes. I make a motion that she take the exam, and if she does not pass, she goes back to school for 100 hours <laughs> and then takes the exam a second time. Second. Motion made by Ms. Coopinger, seconded by Ms. Smith, that she sit for the exam and passes it. If she does not pass, she goes back to school for 100 hours and then takes the exam again. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes carried. Reciprocity application for a cosmetology license presented for Jim Shalon, Jim Adam Shalon from Arizona, where he received his cosmetology license by reciprocity from Illinois, which was received by endorsement from Jordan. The transcript from Jordan shows 2,000 hours in the cosmetology curriculum. Let's 
a lot of reciprocities. <laughs> or whatever. I make a motion that he take the Tennessee exam, and if he, uh, well, he's got the hours. Just take, the take the Tennessee exam. I'll second that motion. Motion made by Ms. Cooper, seconded by Ms. Smith, that he sit for the Tennessee exam. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes carry. Okay. Next, we have reciprocity application for Tufik Suki. You did well on that one. <laughs> We're hoping that's correct. <laughs> and for a cosmetology license, Mr. Suki submitted a certification <coughs> along with a school transcript from Lebanon, which verifies 1,500 hours of instruction in the cosmetology curriculum. I make a motion that he take the Tennessee exam. Second. Motion made by Ms. Coopinger, seconded by Ms. Smith, that he sit for the Tennessee exam. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Eyes carry. Next, we have an application for reciprocity of an aesthetics license for Tessa Turnbull. Ms. Turnbull submitted a certification of licensure from the state of Washington along with the school's transcripts, transcript, which verifies 640 hours of instruction in the aesthetic curriculum. And the certification from Washington verifies 500 hours. So the transcript provides 640. <coughs> she was licensed in 03. Yes. No work experience. Six forty hours. Yes. Six forty. I make a motion that she take the Tennessee exam, and if she doesn't pass it, she goes back to school for one hundred and ten hours and retakes the exam. A second. Motion made by Miss Cooper, second by Miss Walker, that she sit for the Tennessee exam, and if she does not pass it, go back for one hundred and ten hours and sit for the exam the second time. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Ayes carry. <coughs> Next, we have an application for reciprocity of an esthetician license for Narjess Yunsi. The applicant submitted a translated certification of training of an aesthetic cosmetician from Tutsi, but no transcripts and five-year work history were submitted. Tanzania, I'm sorry, I'm pronouncing. We need some hour information, don't we? Mm -hmm. I make the motion we table this till we get more information regarding hours. Uh. Motion made by Ms. Smith that we table until we can uh, require more information. Do I hear a second? Second, second by Ms. Wormsley. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed, nay. Ayes carry. Reciprocity of a natural hairstyling license presented for Comfort Kawaku. The applicant has submitted certification from Ghana with three years training in the hairstyling curriculum, but doesn't have hours of instruction to verify the education, but did submit a letter signed by the owner of the hair braiding school in Fayetteville, North Carolina, stating that the applicant has worked as a braider for six years, but no dates of employment are provided. And he's asking for what license? Natural hairstyle. Natural, okay. Are we talking about a friendly stylist that he's working for? Um, no, he just worked in this right. salon for six years. That's what I said. But he got his education before he got here.
Were they licensed in oh, North Carolina? Yeah, that's um, what I was wondering. They didn't provide what they were. Actually, I have Natural hairstylist in North Carolina only requires 300 hours. But I wonder to get that license. To get that license, did they take a test in North Carolina? Right. They didn't. I mean, they didn't submit that they actually have a license in North Carolina. So we could request additional information from her. Well, let me look through her file first. I bring all the physical files in case. Ours is 302, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She attached pictures of her work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's nothing from the state of North Carolina. But if y'all want to see the pictures, I'll pass <laughs> I'll make a motion for table this until we get some more accurate information. Okay, motion is made by Ms. Smith. I second. Second by Ms. Walker that we table until we can get some more information on her hours or testing, anything. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes carry. for a cosmetology license. She has submitted a certification for licensure from Florida with 1,200 hours of instruction in the cosmetology curriculum. <coughs> she obtained her license in 2009 by exam. Is it Florida? Yes. Is. Okay. Here we are. I make a motion to take the Tennessee exam. If she doesn't pass it, she goes back to school for 300 hours. And sits for the exam again. Second. Motion made by Ms. Kubinger, second by Ms. Smith that she take the Tennessee exam. If she does not pass it, go back to school for 300 hours. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Ayes carry. I just wish Terrence was here to enjoy all this. <laughs> 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 First is from Audrey Michelle Stanley. She is a cosmetologist licensee and she's requesting. Uh, hold on, I'm sorry. She lost her paperwork and she's requesting that we waive the six month requirement that she retest because she hasn't completed uh, paying for her license. And then you have six months. The six month rule, but you have once you test and pass, you have to pay for your license in order to receive it. If six months expires, you have to retest. How long has it been? It has been, it's on here actually. If you scroll over, she provides her score. She first passed um, April the <coughs> aesthetics practical portion of the exam, but the theory portion was taken back in December of 2009. But there's actually not a rule of how long you wait between the theory and practical. It's just passing the full test, which I thought was interesting, but something new I learned this week. And she provides a letter. actually just a month late, so had she not lost her paperwork, she would have been able to just pay to get licensed. <coughs> so she's asking that we waive the, the one month. The one month and she 
be able to pay. Right, pay and become licensed. I make a motion that we accept her request. And give her 30 days to get it done. Yeah. Okay. She probably does need a deadline. <laughs> <laughs> she, she says she's trying to better herself. And <laughs> well, was that a motion made by Ms. Cooperinger that uh, we allow her the month extension only. Do I hear a second? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Smith, second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes carry. Okay, next, this is quite an interesting request. Nita Mogensen, who used to be Nita Pop, is a student and she's requesting to take the cosmetology license test. Ms. Smogason attended 1,700-hour cosmetology program in Wisconsin, which meets the Wisconsin state requirements, and there is a letter from the school she attended along with the Wisconsin information on your iPads, um, but she never obtained a license in the state, and now the state can't certify the hours due to the length of time that it's passed. Currently, Ms. Smogason is in our system because she's gone to the school in Tennessee to become a manicurist. She wasn't aware that she had the ability to request that the hours be transferred from state to state and uh, is now requesting that. So she's actually currently in line to take the manicuring exam, but if the board would approve the 1,700 hours of curriculum, she's requesting that she take the cosmetology exam as well. It was in 1982? Yes, and she actually said she attended school in Florida as well while she lived there, but the school in Florida has closed down and they can't certify the hours either, so we don't have any proof. But we know she's got 1,700. Right. Mm -hmm. We know she has 1,700, but it has been some time, obviously. It says 1,700 hours of training. Graduated in 1982. Enclosed his curriculum. And I actually requested if she could provide her transcript from the school, but it seems that the transcript couldn't be provided until after today's board meeting because it was sometime last week when I requested it. So she said uh, she would try to get it, but she didn't get it to me in time. So I told her I'd go ahead and present it with this information so she wouldn't have to wait until February. So she's wanting to get her cosmetology license? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, we have proof of... And she has current, she actually has current Tennessee law, health and sanitation education because she's been going for a manicuring <laughs> curriculum at the state of Tennessee. So she's in line to test for a manicurist license here. She just didn't realize she might have the possibility of transferring these hours because she was told in the past, no, you can't transfer hours. I don't know why or who, but that's just what she had advised. Madam Chairman, I have um, a motion with grant for the uh, privilege of testing hospitality. Okay. Ms. Smith made uh, the motion that we grant her the privilege of taking the cosmetology exam. Second. Second by Ms. Coopinger. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Ayes carry. Next, we have field trip request. Volunteer Beauty Academy in Madison is requesting field trip approval for 18 students and two instructors to visit elite spas, nail and full service salons in Henderson, Tennessee, Hendersonville, Tennessee on December 12th from 9.30 to 1.30 to embrace the enforcement of the theory chapters on nail disorders, manicuring, and pedicuring. Yes. I make a motion we accept. Second. Motion made by Ms. Coopinger, seconded by Ms. Smith. We accept. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes carry. Next, we have Georgia Career Institute from Murfreesboro field trip approval request for permission to take students on November 21st. So this is retroactive approval to Hobby Lobby and Michaels to purchase supplies for portfolios. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
I'll make a motion we deny. Second. Motion made by Ms. Cooper, your second by Ms. Smith. We deny. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Ayes carried. They can't get hours for going shopping. Come on. <laughs> Okay. okay, next we this have the seminar proposal mm -hmm. from Tennessee State University, which was resubmitted with the additional information requested by the board. First, you'll see on your iPad information on each educator and pictures, and then attached after the education information is the agenda for the dynamic team building day and the agenda for the High Impact Teaching Skills Day. And then is an email from myself to Ms. Perkins, you will see, where I requested she provide the information from the board regarding the presenters, the length of the presentation, along with the agenda, workshops, and the breakdown of the hours, full content and course description, and an explanation of the change in subject matter from last year's Milady presentation and also who was involved in facilitating the planning of the meetings. She has provided that six continuing education hours are per each agenda. The training time starts from 8.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. The class titles in 2013 are Dynamic Team Building and High Impact Teaching Skills, and she provides course descriptions in her email. The dynamic team building program focuses on importance of evaluating the team environment and providing specific strategies for building a cohesive and productive team. Participants will define teams and teamwork, identify benefits of teamwork and the ingredients for team motivation, and work through six practical steps in team building. The high impact teaching skills and presentation techniques covers step-by-step -step activities to take participants through steps developing and delivering classroom <coughs> presentations and steps for increasing personal awareness on how to use the CREATE model with nine elements for delivering a powerful presentation. She then says that the changes from 2012 were the first class was called Igniting Exceptional Performance as opposed to this year's Dynamic Team Building Proposal and the second class was called Inspiring the Creative Soul to Learn where this year's is High Impact Teaching Skills and Presentation Techniques. She provides the class descriptions from 2012 in her email as well. And then she additionally states that she is the contact for the TSU conference and generally once the Milady workshops conclude, they add a PSI component and a Tennessee board question and answer to make up the difference in, comp in, in hours. Pursuant to Ms. Waller's request in the past, they have asked Milady to conduct, to conduct a lunch activity so that participants could be engaged in activity in order to get hours during lunch. And that isn't reflected in the information below, but if the board would like additional information presented, she can do so. So they've uh, laid out this, um, where there's a, there's a total of 12 hours that we can see, and they need 16, correct? Right, and I think the lunches would add an additional hour, so that would be 14. I'm not sure where the other two hours were. My question also, I see six, who's teaching these classes? The, the so individuals, many. right, the individuals, the educators at the beginning of the proposal. All the of them? Each and every one? See, in the past they've had one teacher. I'm not sure she didn't break that down. Okay, who's the board members? It's worked on putting this together? Nobody. Is this Tennessee all, State? All seminars. Yes. I'm going next Monday to uh, for the planning committee for the University of Tennessee instructor seminar planning mm -hmm. meeting. And I, actually, I think there's supposed to be two board members going. Is anybody else going to that? Because last year, um, Diane Buchanan and I both went. And she's off the board now. Instructors and educators on the board to attend all of these when they're put together. On the planning meetings? Yes. Yeah, it sounds like she's well, already got this put together. that she is literally the only con <coughs> the contact. So if if I need to, I can get in touch with her and find out what board member or you all can appoint someone for the board to get well, in touch. We've already done that. <coughs> so who did it last year? Oh, Miss Colley. Okay. 
we asked uh, in the, what well, was in the in mm -hmm. motion that uh, we had uh, the, our educator to sit in all, all educator and board members sit in on all three of them when they were put together. And we talked about uh -huh. that again last month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, important that they have a part of it. And uh, see, this is it sounds like it's already been put together without contacting anybody, and that's that has been done that way in Memphis also. From your recollection of last year, Miss Colley, did they contact you when they were getting things put together? They contacted Miss Waller, and she contacted me. Okay. But I'm very interested in the instructor. Have her call me where she and I can get together, and another person, whoever would like to. Okay. 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 You want to drive to Nashville? Okay. Sure. And Let nine, me know when. Nine and I. So are you going to Knoxville? I can't go next week. Oh, no. Next Monday. Somebody see us. You can be there? Oh, okay, good. I can't. So, do you want me just to advise that you, I'll call her and let her know that you'll be in touch, or do we want to approve this with the contingency that you all will help with? I, I'm not sure. I don't think we should approve anything till we meet with her. Okay. Is she a new person doing no. this? No. Oh, no. Not at all. So norm normally she would get the feedback from the board member. It would right, be. It was. Right. And I, mm -hmm. I was. I thought I didn't understand that a board member was supposed to be part of that. So that's mm -hmm. my meeting understanding um, from day one. Well, they're just they're they're supposed to get feedback from board um, members. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the board members are, the board is responsible for the seminars and it's a reflection on the board as some of the things that uh, is presented in in a seminar where they, there's because a you have to call a home. Yeah. There's a role. There's been times when you had to call a home and dismiss that class. The role on this, and I'm going to read it for my and y'all's information. So an application for approval of a teacher training program in cosmetology shall include a summary of the education and experience of each instructor, which has been presented, the scheduled dates of the program, the proposed curriculum of the program. The applicant shall demonstrate satisfaction of the board that the teacher training program submitted will contain 16 hours of instruction, which they have not done that. Uh, emphasize teaching methods for the entire duration, restrict the size of classes sufficiently to ensure adequate attention to all participants, proceed for not more than two hours without a break, and prohibit demonstrations or presentations for commercial purposes. Um, promptly after the completion of a teacher training program, they have to send the board a roster showing the names and social security numbers, which they do after the fact, and the sponsor shall provide an opportunity for the attendees to evaluate the program and the evaluations are afforded to the office of the board. So that's the rule. So pursuant to the rule, she needs to give additional information and pursuant to the board's policy, you all would like a member to serve on a committee and help with the plan. And an edu our educator and a yes, instructor. Okay. See, the board has instructors that sits on the board. Okay. So, so that is when it's put together, uh, doing the program. That's, that wouldn't be right. necessarily anything to what we're talking about, what you just read. No, this is exactly the rule for teacher training programs to be approved. Right. So. But that, this is putting the whole thing together. Mm -hmm. See, the reason I clearly want to make that uh, motion Nina, as an educator, would be helpful in planning that, and then, of course, uh, uh, an instructor, they naturally would because they sit through that over the years. And so we can hear can, topics yes, that yeah. would like to be incorporated. Yeah, that you need. Yeah, this, it needs to be a little more detailed for us to accept this. When we bring the one at UT that I've been involved with, 
back to the board it's real specific about who's teaching what and how many hours there are so and and I'm I'm confused that it doesn't look like there's 16 hours on this one anyway yeah. She calls me, I'll call 9A and we'll set up a meeting for the three of us. Okay. Is there any way I could get a hard copy of this? This? Just this particular thing? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Just mail it to me whenever you have time. Okay. And Rachel, the lady in Memphis, what's her name? Mary Ann? Mary, Mary Ann McDonald. Mary Ann McDonald. She, we've only met with her physically once but she contacts us and she gets feedback from us on on topics okay. and and she applies them accordingly and then she gets recommendations from us also for presenters okay. it could be for a topic that we suggested or or something that she has and she needs a presenter for that particular topic so that's what we've been doing and you're right there. You can talk to her more, or have you know, than I. <laughs> we just do. We do email. Well, okay. for the most part. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Next is a question for the board, which we presented last month. The student hourly daily maximum per rule 04401.037 and TCA 6224120. Uh, school has proposed a curriculum of three 10 hour days. Pursuant to my interpretation of the law, is you can't go for more than eight hours a day, six days a week. That to me meant collectively we don't want people trying to obtain a curriculum in a matter of a few weeks, going seven hours a day, 15 hours a day, in order to cram it all in. Now, logically, my interpretation, it doesn't seem that it would be of any benefit or impact to restrict a three-day, 10-hour-a-day program pursuant to the interpretation of the law. Now, we looked through the minutes. Hosan looked through the minutes and the board office looked through the minutes and we even called Terrence to see if he remembered because he was here and we contact him on these sorts of things sometimes because he does remember sometimes and he didn't remember either so because we couldn't find it in the minutes and because the lady who was at the meeting last month she did not find a letter that the board sent and she said she thought she had it she couldn't find anything so we're just asking it, it was voted in that they could attend 48 hours a week, period. Doesn't matter if it's okay. 10 hours one day okay. and six hours the next day. But it was when Dr. Adcock was chair. I remember that well. So can we get a motion to approve that they can offer a three day, 10 hour per day curriculum? So, so am I to understand that, so the maximum per week is 48, 48. hours. <clears throat> but the comp but the daily but there's no daily restriction necessary. Well in the book in the book it is the book. The book, the book we, says a minimum of eight. Mm -hmm. But we changed that. I wish I knew when. Well the way it's the way it's read is eight hours per day, six days a week. So my interpretation, and you can read it different ways, is that you can't go seven days a week for eight hours. Or you can't go six days a week for nine hours, so, meaning you can't go more than six days for eight hours, but that doesn't restrict three days for ten. So I read it collectively, where I guess you could interpret that you can't go for five hours, five days for twelve hours, but that, if you're doing the 48-hour way, which is what Ms. Colley said has been interpreted in the past, would prevent that, but it wouldn't prevent 30 hours in three days. So, so it doesn't address a minimum. Go oh, yeah. So I'm just curious, but it do, it doesn't 
so an, a minimum is not an issue. I can a number. Attention, attention. Our uh, event uh, is complete of the firearm test. If you hear a firearm, treat it like an emergency. Again, this is in a by test. Thank you. I'm just curious, but there's no minimum. Correct. Okay. That's my understanding. There's okay. basically a maximum, which makes sense because the board would want to restrict schools from pushing hours out, but the board wouldn't necessarily want to restrict schools from offering different curriculums to meet different individual schedules. I just go back to nurses. Nurses work 12-hour days, three days a week, and that's their full-time schedule. Um, you know, you can go to night law school and, and get your law curriculum. You do, and and you know, I think the purpose of the statute was just so that you couldn't cram the 300 hours into you know a couple of weeks so if that's what your education required. They want it to be obtained in an efficient manner. So we need a motion. Well. It's 0.4401.037 and 62.4120B. Okay. I have the same thing. The minimum is 25 hours per week, actually, girls. Okay. So the, okay. there's a weekly minimum, but not a daily minimum. Okay. There's no need. You said 62 days, 4 days, what? 120B is what talks about the minimum of 25 hours. 120B. Is the minimum. And the mm -hmm. rule is 04401.03, section 7. Could you repeat that? 04401.03. Sorry, section 8. And the rule says any person holding a valid Tennessee, this is the Barber rule. It also is in the cosmetology rule. There's a couple of different places where it's stated. But this one talks about barbers transferring credit hours as cosmetologists. And it says the, a minimum of 25 hours per week, not to exceed 48 hours in a week. All right, what about? As a school operating both day and night classes shall designate the times for each. In no event shall a student attend school for more than eight hours per day, six days per week. Right, and my interpretation of that was eight hours per day, six days a week. So you can't go seven days a week over eight hours, and you can't go nine hours a day for four days. You can't, you can't exceed six days a week. And the purpose is this, they just want to offer a three-day, ten-hour-per-day curriculum. And there's really no point in restricting that because what's the health and safety of the public in restricting a three-day, ten-hour curriculum per day? Okay. That's my law. Okay, this is what, I, what I'm getting back to then. If we're going to anything in the law book when it says, in no event shall a student attend more than eight hours a day, that means more, they cannot But for six days a week. You're stopping there. You have to continue reading. Eight hours a day, six days a week. So you put them together and that's 48 yeah, hours. Yeah, you can't cram like 10 hours for the whole no. week to, um, every day or something. So my interpretation and your interpretation are different. So it's up to the board as a whole to review that and determine whether these individuals who are asking for clarification can offer a three-day, 10-hour day curriculum. Well, according to what we talked about and did back yeah, several years ago, is 48 hours a week. 
that's it. Right. Can't get any more. It, okay. We didn't. So however you get it. However you get it. You way, could get a 48 hour per week. That's the way it was. I wish we could find it in the minutes, but it, we did. So can I get a motion to approve the three day, 10 hour curriculum? I make a motion that we approve. Okay, motion made by Ms. Coppinger. A second. Second by Ms. Uh, Walker. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay, ayes carry. Okay. Lovely. Okay, after the questions for the board, I have a staff attorney report. There is several cases on their report. I'm going to read the first case, which is a represented matter, and then I'm going to give you an explanation as to the next 38 cases before I read all the case numbers. Ma'am, may I ask a question? Sure. This young man told me he was going to appear before the board during this afternoon section. What's your name? I do not have anything for him on the agenda. Mr. Green, did you speak to me about appearing before? I felt uh, that's why I'm here today, and I have my notification. That, um, what happened was I had uh, my life, and I'm the shop manager. My life has expired for five weeks. I've not noticed it. I've quit. I've already reinstated. I took care of it as soon as I became aware of it. But I got a citation, so I figured I wanted to take care of my citation. Okay. Well, will matters presented to the board are presented in well, non- I don't hear what we do. I'm sorry, the matters on the legal report as presented are presented anonymously because the board, yes, uh, they don't have any notification of who receives these notice of violations because if they go to the salon that receives the notice of violation, I'm not saying that, okay, you're, no, no, what I mean is the board, I know you've been here all day and I just wondered because he told me long ago. Is that Sorry, what were you saying before I interrupted you? Yep. Okay, so there's one represented matter, and then there's going to be about 
30 other license matters. I'm going to stop after I read the first presented matter and explain the next ones to you before I go read 19 case numbers or 38. Okay. Okay. So, for the December 3rd, 2012 legal report, the first case is 2012-18781. This matter was previously presented on October 1st, 2012. And on August 16th, as follows, an August 16th, 2012 notice of violation alleges the area inspector observed an individual practicing cosmetology in an unlicensed shop. The inspector advised the shop was a wig store, but the customer who received the service did not have a wig. He further noted that there were two other workstations set up for service. And the board previously issued a cease and desist advisory notice relative to the matter in June 2012. Board office records indicate no shop application had been received as of this date of the report. The board decision was to offer as a formal hearing with authority to settle by consent order with a payment of a $500 civil penalty. A response to the consent order was sent from the respondent's counsel advising that the shop merely sells wigs and beauty supplies and does not perform cosmetology services on any person's natural hair. Further, the respondent counsel advised the shop does not charge a fee for any adjustments or alterations to the wig, but simply charges for the wigs sold. No cost is added for adjustments or alterations, which furthers their position that there would be there wouldn't be any violation of the Cosmetology Act. The response states that the customer who was present at the time of the inspection did have a wig, and the individual who provided the service was merely ingesting and trimming the wig, but not attempting to cut into the natural hair of the customer. The respondent represents represents that his business does not perform cosmetology services and further only sells a product, wigs and beauty supplies. The area inspector was contacted by board counsel to clarify the details of the notice of violation. The inspector advised that the employee at the respondent shop was styling the client's hair and the client did not have a wig at the time of the inspection. The recommendation is to concur with the board's prior decision. Okay, the next cases are all reciprocity applications which are going to be recommended for formal approval. And let me know if you have questions. After I read these cases, they're all the same fact pattern and there are 38 of them. Bear with me. Just have to read them into the record. With that many reciprocities plus all of them today? These are reciprocity applications that were discovered in the audit that Bill talked about previously that we did not have documentation for. Thus, we have done some due diligence with the states who were thought to have issued their reciprocal license information and or their education and we have found none. So, we are opening them as complaints and recommending formal charges in order to revoke the licenses. So, there are 38, 39, but we're on 38 right now. The 39th is somewhat different. And they received the license illegally? No, we just, there's no documentation in the board office to show that they should have received the license. And so, we've contacted them and we've contacted the states in which the license was supposedly received from reciprocally. And this is something that Bill had discussed with you at the first meeting, the licensing files that were missing information that we were investigating and part of the audit finding. So, number two, 2012 
An administrative board office complaint has been filed against the above reference respondents, licensees, alleging fraud in procuring reciprocity licenses. Upon review of the board office records, a letter was sent to each of the above respondents requesting certifications of licensure from the reciprocal states or proof of education and licensure records. To date, no responses to the requests on the above cases have been received. Further, board legal counsel contacted each state from where the respondent allegedly obtained the certifications of licensure and or hours of education in order to review the possibility of administrative mistakes. All responses requested from the reciprocal states have been received, each of which certifies a license search was made for each respondent listed and no records were found that indicate any respondent is currently licensed or has ever been licensed with such states. A second letter was then sent to each respondent notifying them of the initiation of a board office complaint which included the additional information provided by each state and once again requested a response. No responses to the complaints have been received from the respondents as of this date. The recommendation is to authorize a formal hearing on all of the above cases. So you're telling me that these people have Tennessee license saying they got them through reciprocity. Is that what you're saying? Yes, ma'am. From different states which yes. don't exist. The license don't exist. Correct. I didn't mean the state's on the license. Okay. So would we see all of these at one time? Yes. There is a special docket day going to be set up by litigation. Two docket days going to be set up by litigation counsel who's here now, Mark Green. If you all have any questions, I'm sure he'd be happy to answer them as well if I cannot. Um, where we are going to set them all in a matter of two days and get them all heard at once. In February? So we'll be here for two days? No. 21? The, the board has approved an administrative law judge to hear the contested cases. So What day of the week? Oh, excuse me. Oh, hold on. And, 27. and what day of the week are those? I don't know. Um, no, it's an administrative oh, law judge. That's, it doesn't matter then. Okay. That's a Tuesday and a Wednesday. All right. Well, we're not involved, so it doesn't matter. What you were saying? Oh, yes. I was just saying that it'll be heard in front of the administrative law judge, and they'll all be heard within those two days. Okay. I'm sorry. I thought you meant we had to be for two days. No. Mm -mm. I misunderstood. I'm sorry about that. Any other questions about this? The next one, case number 39, 2012-02433-1, an administrative board office complaint has been filed against the above reference respondent, alleged fraud in procuring the reciprocity license. Upon review of the board office records, a letter was sent to both respondent and reciprocal state requesting certification <coughs> excuse me, of licensure or proof of education and licensure records. A response from the reciprocal state received certifies that a license search was made for the respondent and no records were found that indicate the respondent is currently licensed or has ever been licensed within the state. Accordingly, a second letter was sent to the respondent notifying him of the initiation of a board office complaint. The letter included additional information provided by the reciprocal state and once again requested a response. The respondent came into the board office and met with legal counsel who explained to the respondent that an application for licensure was submitted and then a license was issued, but was never sent due to insufficient documentation. Legal counsel advised the respondent about an application for the issued reciprocal cosmetology license and the listed education in California and provided the respondent with copies of the letters sent in the California records. The respondent denied any knowledge of the allegations and state he had never been to California and further verbally agreed to enter into a voluntary license revocation. The recommendation is to authorize a formal hearing with the authority to settle by consent order for the license revocation. Case number 40, 2012-0220-1. 
An October 1, 2012 complaint alleges the respondent shop employs a very unprofessional cosmetologist who is unsanitary, horrible, and makes defamatory statements about the complainant, a prior co-worker. Several examples were provided which explain the demeanor of the individual who is the subject of the complaint. A response to the complaint received from the owner of the respondent shop states that since the complainant voluntarily quit from the respondent shop, the shop owner has been receiving letters from him which include accusations the respondent owner has determined to be false. Recommendation is to close with no action. Case number 2012-02503-1, a November 1, 2012 notice of violation alleges the area inspector observed two individuals servicing clients without valid board issued licenses and licensed manicure shop. The inspector also observes the manager of the shop servicing a client without wearing an ID tag. Further, the inspector observed a washer and dryer which were visible to the public and dirty buffers and files improperly stored at workstations. Recommendation is to authorize a formal hearing with authority to settle by consent order and payment of a $1,000 civil penalty. Case number 2012-02317-1, an October 23rd complaint was received against the respondent school by a student enrolled in the respondent school. The complaint alleges prior to starting school she asked if it would be possible if she needed to transfer to another location depending on her schedule and she was advised by the respondent school that she could. She then wrote a letter to request to transfer to another location sometime thereafter and the respondent school refused to allow the transfer because of the lack of students at the particular location where she was enrolled. A response to the complaint received from the respondent school states that admissions representative advised all my manicure class students that there would be there would need to be full enrollment because of the size of the class in order for the school to be able to offer the particular class. Further, the response states that the students sign a contract and further the school is not required to amend the contract unless the school chooses. In this case, they do not allow students to change their schedules and if they take the night manicure class and further contend the complainant was never told she would be allowed to change her schedule because of the limited amount of students enrolled in the particular night class. The recommendation is to close with no action. Case number 2012-023701, an October 25, 2012 notice of violation alleges the area inspector observed a licensed cosmetologist, also the owner and manager of the shop, coloring a client's hair while her personal license and shop license were both expired. Board office records indicate that both licenses have now been renewed. The recommendation is to authorize a formal hearing with authority to settle by consent order and payment of a $500 civil penalty. Case number 2012-02144-1, a September 18, 2012 complaint was received against the respondent school by a student enrolled at the respondent school. The complaint alleges the respondent school failed to pay for her practical portion of the cosmetology test in a reasonable time subsequent to passing the theory portion of the test. The response received from the respondent school states that the complaint fails to state a violation of the board's rules, that the complaint is, un that the complaint is unfounded and adamantly denied by the respondent school. Further, the response requests the complaint be dismissed in its entirety without further action. The recommendation is to close with no further action. Case number 2012-02371-1, a September 19, 2012 notice of violation alleges the area inspector observed the shop open for business and the owner of the shop, a licensed cosmetologist, styling a client's hair without passing the required inspection and obtaining a license to operate the shop. The board office records indicate an application for a shop license was received on September 19 and approved on 11-6-2012. Recommendation is to authorize a formal hearing with authority to settle by consent order and payment of a $250 civil penalty. Case number 2012-02312-1, an October 7 consumer complaint received alleges the complainant received a prior pedicure service at the respondent shop where the pedicure she used a callus razor on her feet. When requesting this same tool during a different visit to the respondent shop, the complainant was told the pedicurist was not allowed to use the tool and further that the owner manager was rude when advising this. The complainant states the respondent shop owner is rude, unprofessional, and hostile and condescending. A response received from the respondent shop owner states the shop never uses razors in their pedicures and further that when the owner advised the complainant of the issue, she became rude and raised her voice stated that no one should diagnose her. Recommendation is closed with no further action. Case number 2012-02372-1, a September 19, 2012 notice of violation alleges the area inspector observed the shop open for business and the owner of the shop, a licensed cosmetologist working on a client's nails without passing the required inspection and obtaining a license to operate the shop. Board office records indicate that an application for a shop license was received and approved. The recommendation is to authorize a formal hearing with authority to settle by consent order and payment of a $250 civil penalty. Case number 2012-02373-1, an October 4, 2012 notice of violation alleges the area inspector observed a shop open for business while no manager was present in a licensed cosmetology shop. 
the inspector found five workstations set up for service but only one license posted. No services were being provided at the inspection time. The recommendation is to close with a letter of warning. Case number 2012-02375-1. On October 1st, notice of violation alleges the area inspector observed three individuals braiding hair at inspection time in a licensed natural hairstylist shop. Two of the individuals were practicing without valid board issued licenses. The recommendation is to authorize a formal hearing with authority to settle by consent order and payment of a $500 civil penalty. Case number 2012-02376-1. October 5th, notice the violation alleges the area inspector observed an unlicensed individual performing a pedicure on a client in a licensed cosmetology shop. The board has previously authorized a formal hearing with authority to settle by consent order in a previous case against this respondent shop at the March 5th board meeting. To date, the respondent shop has not accepted the settlement offer. The recommendation is to combine the case with the other pending cases where a formal hearing is authorized. Case number 2012-02486-1. On October 5th, 2012 and October 26, 2012, notice of violation both allege the following. The area inspector observed an unlicensed individual threading a client's eyebrows in an unlicensed shop. Board office records indicate that an application to license the shop was received on October 16, 2012, and such application is still pending. The allegations in both notices do not constitute a, no a violation of the Cosmetology Act. The recommendation is to close the case with no action and request the area inspector complete the shop inspection within 10 days, if applicable. Case number 2012-02472-1, October 5, 2012, notice of violation reports the area inspector observed a man performing a manicure service without a valid board issued license in a manicure shop. The recommendation is to authorize a formal hearing with authority to settle by consent order and payment of a $500 civil penalty. Case number 2012-02471-1, October 16, 2012, notice of violation reports that the area inspectors entered the shop to find a nail customer receiving a manicure while no shop license was posted. Further, the shop manager amended providing the service without a valid board license posted. Board office records indicate the shop license was revoked pursuant to consent order entered on June 14, 2012. An application for a new shop license was received on October 12, 2012, and such application is still pending. Recommendations to issue a cease and desist advisory notice with the request for the area inspector to complete the shop inspection within 10 days. Case number 2012-02473-1, on October 16, 2012, notice of violation states the area inspector observed a licensed cosmetology shop open for business without a manager or shop license posted. The two cosmetologists performing services at the time of the inspection were questioned by the inspector about the manager and stated that there was no manager at the time of inspection. Board office records indicate that the licensed shop was not, has not updated the manager listed for the shop as of the date of this report. Recommendation is to authorize a formal hearing with authority to settle by consent order with payment of a $500 civil penalty. Case number 2012-02474-1. On October 17, 2012, notice of violation states that the area inspector observed the owner of the licensed manicure and skin care shop performing services while his personal license was expired. The inspector also observed dirty floors, dirty buffers, files, and properly stored in an unsanitary skin care room in the shop. Board office records indicate the owner does not hold a personal license. The recommendation is to issue a cease and desist advisory notice. Case number 2012-02475-1. On October 18, 2012, notice of violation states that the area inspector observed a licensed cosmetology shop open for business with an expired shop license posted. The shop license expired on January 31, 2012. Board office records indicate the shop license has been renewed. The recommendation is to authorize a formal hearing with authority to settle by consent order with the payment of a $250 civil penalty. Case number 2012-02476-1. On October 17, notice of violation states the area inspector observed a master barber working in a licensed cosmetology shop. According to the departmental licensing records, the shop does not hold a barber shop license. The recommendation is to close with a letter of warning. Case number 2012-02481-1. On October 23, 2012, notice of violation states that the area inspector observed an expired shop license posted in a licensed cosmetology shop. The inspector also observed an expired cosmetology license and further found two licensed cosmetologists practicing with dirty scissors and clippers. Board office records indicate that the shop license has now been renewed and the cosmetology license renewal fees have been received. The recommendation is to authorize a formal hearing with authority to settle by consent order with payment of a $500 civil penalty. Case number 2012-02482-1. 
October 18, 2012, Notice of Violation states the area inspector observed a cosmetology shop open for business under an expired shop license, which expired 8-31-2012. The inspector further states the manager, also the owner's, personal license was expired and was not present at the inspection time. Board office records indicate both licenses remain expired as of the date of this report. Recommendation is to authorize a formal hearing with authority to settle by consent order with the payment of a $500 civil penalty with a cease and desist advisory notice. Case number 2012-02484-1. On October 25, 2012, notice of violation states the area inspector observed a cosmetology shop open for business without the manager present at inspection time. The inspector also observed a small black dog present in the shop. The inspector also reports that there were no customers and the shop was clean. Recommendation is to authorize a formal hearing with authority to settle by consent order with payment of a $500 civil penalty. Case number 2012-02491-1. October 15th, notice of violation alleges the area inspector observed an individual coloring a client's hair without possessing, possessing a valid board issued license in a licensed cosmetology shop. The recommendation is to authorize a formal hearing with authority to settle by consent order and payment of a $500 civil penalty. Case number 2012-02492-1. On October 31st, 2012, notice of violation alleges the manager, also the owner, was not present at inspection time and the shop license was not posted in the licensed cosmetology shop. No services were being provided at the time of inspection. The area inspector states that the owner came while she was at the shop. Recommendation is to close with a letter of warning. Case number 2012-02501-1. On November 1st, 2012, notice of violation alleges the area inspector observed dirty floors, three dirty workstations, four pedicure chairs with buildup around the drain pipe and jets, nail dust and tips on the workstations, and tools improperly stored in the licensed shop. Further, the inspector found an air mattress and pillow in the back room of the shop. The recommendation is to authorize a formal hearing with authority to settle by consent order and payment of a $1,000 civil penalty. Case number 2012-02502-1. In November 2nd, 2012, notice of violation alleges the area inspector observed three individuals servicing clients without wearing ID tags in a licensed manicure shop. The inspector also observed a hot wax machine with all tools necessary to perform the waxing in the shop. Further, the inspector found a couch and a hammock in the rear of the shop and states that it appears someone was sleeping in the shop. The recommendation is to authorize a formal hearing with authority to settle by consent order and payment of a $750 civil penalty. Case number 2012-02504-1. On November 8, 2012, notice of violation alleges the area inspector observed dirty floors and walls in a licensed cosmetology shop. The inspector also found malfunctioning ultraviolet sanitizer at the shop station and unclean and properly stored tools and hair dryers. The area inspector also stated the shop was given a previous verbal warning about the issues. The recommendation is to authorize a formal hearing with authority to settle by consent order and payment of a $250 civil penalty. Case number 2012-02505-1. October 8, 2012, notice of violation alleges the area inspector observed buffers, dusters, and trails which were improperly stored in a licensed manicure shop. The inspector also found unclean pedicure filters and manicure tables in the shop. No services were being provided at inspection time. Recommendation is to close with a letter of warning. Case number 2012-02530-1. On November 16, notice of violation alleges the area inspector observed a licensed cosmetologist cutting a client's hair without wearing an ID tag and another cosmetologist the shop manager was not wearing an ID tag in a licensed cosmetology shop. The inspector also observed black mold and crud buildup around the jets and pipes and pedicure chairs in the back of the shop. The recommendation is to authorize a formal hearing with authority to settle by consent order and payment of a $500 civil penalty. Case number 2012-02480-1. On October 26, 2012, notice of violation alleges the area inspector observed an individual servicing a client without a valid board issued license in a licensed manicure shop. The owner admitted that the individual servicing the client was unlicensed. Further, the owner of the shop was performing a manicure without wearing an ID tag. The inspector also found dirty buffers and files in the drawer at the workstation. Recommendation is to authorize a formal hearing with authority to settle by consent order and payment of a $500 civil penalty. Case number 2012-02529-1. November 15, 2012, notice of violation alleges the area inspector observed two licensed cosmetologists providing services without wearing ID tags in a licensed manicure shop. The inspector also observed inadequate wet sterilizer and, and the back, in the back sink, nail brushes, two drill bits, nail dusters, which were improperly stored and found, a wax machine with all tools necessary to perform waxing in the shop. The recommendation is to authorize a formal hearing with authority to settle by consent order and payment of a $750 civil penalty. The end. The end. Uh, is there any discussion?
If not, do I hear, have a motion that we accept? Madam Chairman, I think there's some that we need to flag. Uh, okay. 48, 53. Wait a minute, let me get that. 59. Wait a Flag? When you say flag. Okay. Attention to or send the inspector back. Not just forget about it. 48, what was the other one? Well, 48, no services were being provided when the inspector went in. And five, it's, there's, there's really no violation there. I mean, not, I mean, there's supposed to be a licensed manager while the shop is open, but the fact that no services were being provided would be really hard to do anything with. But if you'd like an inspector to follow up with you. 53 is... Oh, I'm sorry. The area inspector is going back to the shop in 10 days on 53 to complete the shop inspection. Was there something else on this one? It wasn't completed? No. Is that what you're saying? Correct. They wrote the notice of violation and didn't complete the opening inspection. Um, did you say 57 or 59? Yeah. All right, 57. 57 needs a dual license. Because they're going to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the cosmetology board, the inspector should have written that as a barbershop notice of violation. And that's why we're issuing a letter of warning. But we can send the inspector back it, out to make Is it sure. a cosmetology shop? Right, it is. Well, it's. So it should have been a barber notice of violation instead of cosmetology notice of violation. That was the problem. Fifty-nine. Fifty-nine. We're issuing a. Did I miss something on fifty-nine? And what was the yeah, other one? Let's see. Sixty-four. Yeah, sixty-four. Sixty-four. That definitely needs to be increased. Mm -hmm. There's a history. Mm -hmm. Seven hundred and fifty dollars is not enough. We've got a number of things going on there. Well, compared, I was just going in comparison to some of the other major uh, federal violations. Probably sufficient. And I have one question um, that one of these brought to my mind. Have the inspectors been notified about the judge's ruling on the threading? They have. Okay. I just want to make sure. And the uniform, the uniform of the uh, uh, inspections all the time? Yes. Mm -hmm. We went over that in our inspector training. We're still learning kinks, though, every day. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any more, Ms. Smith and Ms. Huckabee? I'm okay. Do I hear a motion we accept? I make a motion we accept. Motion made by Ms. Coppinger is seconded by? A second. Ms. Walker, that we accept. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Ayes carry. Okay, now we have consent orders for two. 2012 in the amount of $3,500 and those are the page after the legal report. We just need a motion to accept. I make a motion we accept. Motion second. made by Ms. Cup, uh, Cupinger, seconded by Ms. Smith that we accept. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes How carry. Much? How much was it? 3500 $3, And then the beautiful eyebrows memo and order is on there. We've already discussed that. Was there any further discussion? And then I needed to give you all an update of the Ms. Boss study group meeting. A bunch of the estheticians and the cosmetology field were present in the meeting. It was quite interesting. The board is, the panel is trying to determine 
who, not necessarily who needs to be regulated, but they are going to meet again in January and with a statement, basically an opinion of the panel, that this should be regulated, that it's up to the legislature who to regulate it, that it does intertwine different fields, cosmetology being one of them because aesthetics is involved, medical being another one of them because doctors are involved, nurses being another one of them because nurses are involved. And the panel members agree that it does need to be regulated. They also agree that there should be training that is specifically required for these devices and that there needs to be some sort of supervision. But we're not sure that a specific opinion is going to be given as to these different things. They want to come up with a definition of med spa, but that hasn't been nailed down in particularity yet. It, does this has this is the SR ninety four because yes. I tried to find that I couldn't find anything on it um, but um, I believe the minutes from the meetings are posted on the medical board website. Oh, the medical board. Okay. Uh huh. It's the, the health boards, the board of medical examiners, the head panel member is Dr. Zanoli, and there should be a posting for the January meeting coming up because there's a meeting. I believe on the 10th of January. I'm not sure it's been set in firm yet, but they sent us all an email asking what our availability was, and I think everybody had concurred with the 10th what was their availability. Okay. Um, unless you all have any questions, that's all I have. Okay, and we do not meet in January, is that correct? That's correct. We don't meet until February. And I believe our agenda has this meeting here in February. We will not be meeting in this particular room. We will let you all know where we will be meeting in February. It will be in this building. So, just not in this room. So we'll let you all know before February. Because this room will be under construction. I believe we'll probably be in a brand new sparkly room. Good. So. Well, everybody have a happy new year and a Merry Christmas. Do I hear a motion we adjourn? So much. Motion made by Ms. Smith, we adjourn. Second? A second. By Ms. Walker. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, aye. Ayes carry. Merry Christmas. Ooh, Merry, Merry Christmas. Thank you all for all my treats. I'm looking forward to doing it. You're welcome. Gonna ruin my lunch. Oh, I saw him.